Good morning, everyone. My name is Gabe Albornoz, the president of the Montgomery County Council, and we are going to go ahead and call this session into order. We have two proclamations this morning, one recognizing the anniversary of Roe versus Wade by Councilmember Jawando, and the second proclamation recognizing County Attorney Mark Hansen for his years of service to Montgomery County by myself and the full council. Uh, we're gonna reverse the order this morning uh, so that we can stay on time and on track. Uh, we have a lot to get to today. And so I wanna take a personal privilege here. I had the honor of serving with Mr. Hansen in the previous administration for 12 years as the director of the Recreation Department. We sat together on the cabinet of then County Executive Ike Leggett. And I saw firsthand the dedication and the commitment of Mr. Hansen to all of our county residents as we dealt with some remarkably challenging and difficult circumstances. The role of the county attorney is truly unique because they have to truly be a jack of all trades. The level of complexity of the types of cases that the county is involved in span a very wide range. And Mr. Hansen has led with distinction and honor. He is also extraordinarily humble and somebody who is immensely approachable, has a brilliant legal mind, but also understands that at the end of these cases are people. And so, Mr. Hansen, I wanna thank you for truly a remarkable career. All of us in the county and the council are forever indebted to your leadership and your dedication. You have established a remarkable team over many years. And I know that this is a bittersweet moment for you, I'm sure, uh, but I'll now turn it over to you to say a few words before formally reading the proclamation. Mr. Hansen. Well, thank you, uh, council member, council president uh, Albernas. Um, it has been truly an honor to serve as the chief legal officer for the county. Um, I haven't um, heard the proclamation yet, so perhaps I should reserve comments until after I have heard what what, uh, what is to be said, um, if that would be all right with you. Absolutely, let's do that. So I will read the proclamation right now. Proclamation of the Montgomery County Council, whereas Mark Hansen has been a valuable asset to Montgomery County, serving as county attorney, providing leadership to 50 attorneys who provide legal services to the county government in litigation, transaction, and general counsel matters, and whereas prior to his appointment, Mark served in various positions in the office of the county attorney, uh, OCA since 1984, where he focused on government operations, legislation, and government ethics, and whereas Mark has been the longest serving county attorney for the county since the adoption of the charter in 1968, where he has fostered a highly productive and collegial environment, which is known for turning our first class legal work for the county executive and agencies and for the county council. And whereas throughout the years, he has encouraged and mentored many attorneys, including attorneys who have gone on to be judges, attorneys who have served the state and federal governments, and attorneys who have risen in the ranks to serve the county with great legal skill. And whereas Mark has skillfully helped shape legal positions that impacted county government, including drafting and defending the county's transportation impact tax and working with co colleagues to develop a, a legal and litigation strategy that led to the Court of Appeals recognizing the right of the local government to engage in government speech. And whereas an acknowledgement of his leadership in 2014, he received the highest award of the International Municipal Lawyers Association, the Charles Rye Lifetime Achievement Municipal Law Award, an award bestowed rarely only upon individuals whose public service and achievements in the field of municipal law are recognized as truly outstanding. And whereas Mark has been extremely hardworking, working virtually every weekend and holiday for decades, tirelessly devoted to serving the county interests. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby thanks Mark Hansen for serving with humility, integrity, and honor at the highest standards of the legal profession for the past 37 years and wishes all the best as he begins the next chapter, 
presented on this day by myself as council president on behalf of all of my colleagues. Thank you so much, Mr. Hansen, for your tremendous dedication. And Mark, I turn it over to you to say a few words. Well, thank you again. Um, honestly, I feel a bit overwhelmed. Um, that was a wonderful proclamation. I have to confess that I was a little bit concerned that council staff wouldn't be able to read my handwriting, but I'm glad they got it right. <laughs> um, I'm also reminded of, of, uh, of a famous quote from Adley Stevenson, who used to be the governor of Illinois, where I grew up, uh, ran for president two times, and uh, he was uh, noted for uh, commenting that flattery is, fly is fine so long as you don't inhale it. Uh, so I feel am amazingly blessed. Um, I've been fortunate to have the honor of serving as the chief legal officer for Montgomery County, County for the past 12 years, and I've been an attorney in OCA for over 37 years. Being a lawyer for the county has given me the oppor opportunity to work on many immensely challenging legal issues, many of them cutting edge legal issues. Thanks in large part to the county council and many of the actions you've taken. Um, the most recent being the uh, emergency assist assistance relief program that the uh, council enacted during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, leading to uh, federal litigation and uh, a uh, um, uh, victory for the county in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Hands down, this has been the best legal job in the, in the county. But what I will tre treasure the most has been the opportunity to get to work with and to get to know uh, so many extraordinarily talented and dedicated public servants across the broad spectrum of county employees, merit system employees, appointed officials, and elected officials. To the extent that I've experienced uh, success in this job, it's been because I've been surrounded in large part by clients who honestly, many of you have top notch legal minds and probably should have gone to law school, but were smart enough not to. Uh, and an incredibly talented uh, law office, OCA. Parify, if I could paraphrase uh, Michael Jordan, uh, talent wins games, teamwork wins championships. And as you all may remember, Michael Jordan was a member of the Chicago Bulls, uh, which won, I think, six NBA titles in a span of eight years, an incredible achievement. I'd like to close with an observation uh, about OCA. Uh, I'm convinced there is no law firm, private or public, that exceeds OCA's knowledge, skills, and commitment to representing their client. I'm confident OCA will continue uh, to perform at the highest level of effectiveness and integrity. Again, thank you for this proclamation. It's been an honor to serve. Mark, it's been an honor to serve with you, my friend. We're going to give you a standing virtual ovation here. <laughs> but, uh, several of my colleagues have requested to speak. I, I suspect all of them will want to speak because we've all worked with you so closely over the years. Um, I humbly request that my colleagues keep your comments brief. We still have one more proclamation this morning, and as you all know, a very busy morning to get through. So with that, uh, Council Member Friedson. Thanks so much. I'll be very brief, Mark. Uh, congratulations. Thank you for your service. I'll note uh, your uh, service at OCA predates my birth, uh, which uh, uh, speaks to uh, your uh, tremendous tenure. Uh, and in particular, the work, uh, I'll just note two, uh, one, uh, creating the Department of Health and Human Services. I know uh, you uh, work very hard at that. And in this current moment, that has been uh, incredibly important to the county and to our residents to keep everybody healthy and, and safe. Uh, and also uh, working recently uh, on the, uh, uh, the change to our property tax uh, system, which I just really appreciate uh, all of your hard work and, and, and all of your issues. And then the hundreds and thousands of different legal issues that have come up over the last 37 uh, years uh, in the office in the last uh, dozen or so years uh, with you leading it, just really appreciate 
uh, your, your service, your commitment to public service, not just for the county, but for municipal uh, government uh, a, a, as well. You share our, our commitment to that and uh, just wanted to uh, appreciate your, uh, your legal mind and, and sharing your talents uh, with the county for the benefit uh, of all of us. So thank you so much. Appreciate it and best of luck to you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now the chair of our government operations committee, council member Navarro. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Well, Mark, um, you know, it, it, as I'm sitting here reflecting on all of this is the old timer on the council. Um, the one thing that I know I'm going to miss is this notion of having so many extraordinary public servants uh, in our county, such as you, who really epitomize the love and the protection of our institutions. And that is something so important, especially these days that I value so much. And um, when I think of you, that's the first thing that comes to mind is that you have been uh, really an example of how to be the best that you can be, dedicate yourself, your professionalism, um, and your availability and your calm demeanor that has been so critical. But above all, it's always been about understanding that unless our institutions are strong, um, you know, our county cannot be strong and, uh, and you, you, you've done well. So I want to say thank you very much. And, uh, I wish you all the best. Enjoy your time. I wish you health and lots of happiness and lots of fun in your retirement. Thank you, Chair Navarro. Next, uh, we have council member Jawando followed by council member Hucker, then council member Reamer, and then council vice president glass council member Jawando. Thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, what to say? I'll be I'll be brief because all of my colleagues want to speak. Thank you for your service. Um, I, I often uh, at my office. I'm at my home office, but my work office. There's a picture of uh, Charles Hamilton Houston above my desk, who was the first general counsel of the NAACP, first dean of the Howard Law School, a mentor to Thurgood Marshall, the great Marylander. And he, the quote that's there that he said that I, sticks with me is: "A lawyer is either a social engineer." or a parasite on society. And sir, you've been a social engineer in a good, 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 good way. Uh, you've worked with all of us and our predecessors to form and shape the policy uh, that helps improve people's lives. And I think lawyers get a bad rap, but that's what you've done for nearly 40 years. Uh, and the people of Montgomery County uh, and through the precedents that you set, the people of this nation uh, will be indebted to your service. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, as a father of four and three daughters and one who I'm sure is going to be a lawyer, I'll be surprised if she's not, uh, your legacy continues on, sir. And I hope that I can rub off some of that social engineer to my kids. Uh, and Christine is doing a great job. I enjoy working with her, all of us do. Uh, so the service continues in your family. Uh, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Get some rest. Thank you, Councilmember Geronda. Well said. Uh, we've added Councilmembers Rice and uh, cats to the speaker list. Next, we will hear from council member Hucker. Uh, Mark, I think nearly everything's been said, but I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, add my voice to the chorus. I've really enjoyed working with you over the last seven years. Um, you know, I know what an institution you are here and how big the shoes are that you, you lead for all of us. Um, you've really excelled at your work and allowed so many county execs and council members to succeed at their work. And, and, uh, um, I've greatly appreciated your accessibility, uh, availability, as Councilmember Navarro said, uh, giving you so many questions uh, on short notice on the weekends, and your reliability and your steady hand is exactly what, you know, all of us would want in an attorney, um, somebody to, to calm things down at periods of great stress and uh, can convince us that we can get through it if we just put enough careful thought into it. Um, I've really enjoyed working with you. I wish you all the best in the future. Hope we stay in touch because uh, I'm sure I'll need pro bono advice in the future. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Councilmember Reamer. Um, I hope I don't need pro bono advice. <laughs> I mean, for Hans, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mark, it's been a, such a pleasure to serve with you. I, I just... Uh, of all the roles in government that I've had a chance to see up close, uh, I have admired yours um, and the work that you've done and, and to see how you have presented us with challenges and, and as you reason through them and explain them. Uh, it has just, uh, it has been exciting and inspiring and uh, gratifying to, 
to be part of that. And I wish that young people could see what the work of a local government, you know, top legal officer is, because it would inspire so many to pursue a career in law when they think maybe being a lawyer is about being at a big firm and doing billable hours. And I'm sure that's a part of, you know, many careers, but just the, the pure substance and the, you know, the, the depth and the meaning of the work that you do. Uh, it's been fun to see, um, and you do it so well. And I'm just, uh, I'm grateful for your service. So uh, serving with you has been certainly a highlight of, of my time as well. Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Council Vice President Glass. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mark, uh, you know, you and your colleagues have a challenging job. And you've been tasked with navigating between the executive and legislative branches with the public, with the private sector uh, and the state and federal levels. And has has been said, uh, you know, the work that you do is is often under the radar, um, but it is some of the most impactful work here at the county level. And I just want to thank you for always being thoughtful in the way you share information and your legal opinion uh, and for always being accessible when this non-lawyer picks up the phone to ask you uh, some sometimes challenging questions. And I appreciate, um, you know, what I can only imagine is being in law school, going back and forth with you. Um, uh, but uh, I really appreciate you and just want to thank you for your lifetime of public service. And I know that you will continue sharing your thoughts and opinions with us um, as you continue following the, the work that we're trying to do here in the county. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Council Member Rice. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hansen, it's been an absolute pleasure over this uh, past 12 years, sir, uh, working with you and certainly going through a number of things uh, that uh, have challenged our communities, but also uplifted our communities. And that's the beautiful thing uh, about the law uh, it, is it cuts many different ways, oftentimes there to protect uh, the citizens of Montgomery County. And then, unfortunately, in certain times, we have to make sure that uh, we're pursuing uh, folks who have done wrong uh, by this county and holding them accountable. Uh, and you've done both. And that's a beautiful thing. That's what lawyers do. Uh, and so uh, I really just want to thank you for being one of the good ones, uh, one of the ones who's continued to dedicate themselves to truly making sure uh, that we uphold uh, the laws here in Montgomery County and in the state of Maryland and this nation. Uh, but then all, you also uphold the spirit of the law as well, uh, making sure that there's fairness, uh, making sure that those who uh, we know sometimes are the unfortunate and aren't as connected, make sure that they still have the representation that they deserve. And so I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And finally, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Let me just start out by saying, um, Mark, your date of service does not predate my birth. I, just <laughs> that I know there was a question in your mind, and I want to clear that up. Um, first off, thank you and your family very, very much for your, your literally your lifetime of service, and I know in your families as well. I, I, I'm a, a, a follower. I'm a, I'm a person that truly loves the poem If by Kipling. And the first lines are, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. And, of course, there are times during some of these conversations that that is exactly what, unfortunately, has happened. That You have been truly a calm during a time of, at times, a turmoil. And you've been someone who has given great advice, continues to give great advice to a county that you prove, have proven time and time that you have loved and it is truly shown. So thank you, sir, for all of your great service. And I, with that, I turn it back over to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Job well done, Mark. Uh, everybody said it pretty perfectly. We appreciate you and so appreciate your family as well. So with that, uh, we will now move on to the next proclamation being uh, awarded by Councilmember Jawando, recognizing the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. Uh, and I just remind my colleagues, we have an extraordinarily tight schedule this morning, so I'm going to turn this over to Councilmember Juwanda to speak on behalf of all of us here. I know all of us would probably like to speak on this critically important issue, uh, but we got to move forward. So, Councilmember Juwanda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, it's appropriate that we're uh, doing this after we recognize 
the the service of of our uh, with me here. Uh, we have a couple of guests, and we'll be very we'll, we'll move through expeditiously here. Lily Valerian, uh, the executive director of Pro Choice Maryland. Uh, Isabel Argati, who's a commissioner, executive director of the com for the Commission on Women. Uh, we're, this proclamation uh, is important, uh, and, I, and I'm glad we. I want to thank uh, colleagues for all being in support of this, and for Pro Choice Maryland for helping to work with us on this. Uh, on January 22nd, that'll be the 49th anniversary of Roe versus Wade, um, nearly 50 years. And uh, in 1973, when the Supreme Court passed this decision, this was for the first time in our nation's history, women had the right to make decisions about their health care, about their own bodies, about their own reproductive rights. Uh, and it's a shame, fortunately, it shows you that you have to continue to fight for rights. They're not, they're never fully secured. You have to keep in the battle and the fight. We're seeing that with voting and we're seeing it with women's bodies and reproductive health and their rights. They're literally fighting all over again. Uh, in October, the Supreme Court failed to block an anti-abortion law in Texas that, it, that allowed to stand. You have almost 13 copycat laws now allowing people to sue private right of action to, con to compel a woman to do something with her body and to make a health care decision. Uh, a Mississippi law that halts abortions after 15 weeks, uh, well before viability, have turned back the clock on this nearly 50-year precedent uh, that has been one of the most important that the Supreme Court has passed. Before Roe v. Wade, many women had to make life and death decisions about going into alleys and damaging their bodies, uh, and many of them lost their lives trying to make reproductive health care decisions. And we do not want to return to this, obviously, but these cases in Roe being in danger has put us on that brink. And so I thought it was important to recognize uh, the importance of Roe as a precedent, uh, as a civil rights precedent to protect the health care decisions and reproductive rights of women. Um, and I really appreciate uh, the Pro Choice Maryland and Lily and her team and all of our great folks in this county who have been supporting it. Um, I want to turn to them briefly. Uh, and well, let me read the proclamation. I'll follow your role, uh, Council President, so that'll move us along. And then we can uh, do the discussion from uh, just a minute from each person. Uh, proclamation of the Montgomery County Council. Whereas in 19, uh, in, I'm sorry, in a 7 2 decision in 1973, January, the U.S. Supreme Court recognized for the first time that the constitutional right to privacy is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy, making Roe v. Wade the settled law of the land for 49 years. And whereas we trust women will make the best decisions about their bodies, their families, and their futures. And whereas a woman's right to make her own decisions about her pregnancy deserves the highest level of constitutional protection. And a politicized Supreme Court should not choose to curb or restrict the constitutional rights of their of its citizens, and whereas we believe that reproductive health care is essential health care, and whereas it is no longer enough to merely acknowledge the historical significance of Roe v. Wade, we must continue to elevate the fight to preserve one of the most significant women's rights laws in American history. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby honors the 49th anniversary of Roe v. Wade and be it further resolved uh, that the County Council of Montgomery County hereby honors, I'm sorry, uh, hereby honors and acknowledges the significance of this historic event presented on this day, the 18th of January in the year 2022, signed by myself, the Council President, on behalf of all of our colleagues. Uh, really appreciate uh, you all being here today and just want to turn it over briefly to Ms. Valerian and Miss um, Argati. Awesome. Well, good morning and thank you so much, Councilmember Jawando, for sponsoring this proclamation. And thank you to all the esteemed members of the council for having me here today as we commemorate 49 years of Roe versus Wade, the law that enshrined the right to an abortion in the Constitution. My name is Lily Balorian, and I'm the Executive Director of Pro-Choice Maryland. On behalf of the membership of Pro-Choice Maryland, I'm honored to accept this proclamation, recognizing 49 years of Roe. At Pro-Choice Maryland, we believe every person deserves the right to determine if, when, and how they parent. 
This includes ensuring folks have not only the legal right, but that they have access to the full range of abortion care. As we gather today, we sit on the precipice of the tainted Supreme Court's likely decision to gut federal row protections in the next few months. Any decision from the Supreme Court that weakens the protections of Roe will have absolutely devastating consequences for the communities we all care about, particularly for people of color, black women specifically, as well as undocumented people, individuals with disabilities, gender nonconforming and transgender individuals, as well as poor people. While of course the County Council does not have the ability to overturn a Supreme Court decision, today's proclamation is an important example of local action that can be taken to highlight our rights to abortion access and reproductive justice locally, if only our elected officials are willing to lead, as Councilmember Jawando did today. May this proclamation commit all of us to continued action and vigilance on the importance of protecting abortion rights and access in this county, state, and country. I look forward to working with the Council in the future to ensure that Montgomery County remains a pro-abortion access county, regardless of what the Supreme Court decides. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Lily. Ms. Argadi, on behalf of the Commission on Women. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Isabel Argadi. I'm here on the Montgomery County Commission for Women, sitting in for Donna Rojas, our chair, and the rest of the executive committee, and also accompanied by Jody Finkelstein here, executive director. Um, the role of the Commission for Women is really to improve the lives of girls and women in the county, and one of our priorities is health. Um, so thank you so much for bringing this to light. It couldn't be more timely. Um, and as Lily really explained, there's a lot of things going on. Um, and even 40 years later, we're still fighting to keep this right and make sure that women have access to safe and affordable health care um, and really codify that. And so right now, actually, we are supporting the abortion access bill, uh, which hopefully keeps this right in the state of Maryland. Um, it, one, ensures that women have access to affordable and the safe procedure, um, but also improves um, and trains more professionals to be able to give this um, procedure safely. Um, with initiatives like this, educational events, um, legislation, uh, we're really ending the stigma around abortion in our community, which is super needed. Um, we really want to make sure that women are empowered um, for their bodies and themselves to take the appropriate actions and steps, um, and hopefully with our help. Um, lastly, I do want to invite everyone to our women's legislative briefing because conversations like this do not end here. Um, we are going to continue talking about women's health and many other challenges um, until the end of the month on Sunday, January 29th. We'll be talking about how voting women can change everything along with many other um, issues, challenges that women face in our society. And so I hope you join us there. Um, but thank you so much for Council Member Jawando and the rest of the Council for bringing this today here. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to our council president. I know uh, we want to allow at least yeah. one of our colleagues to speak. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So uh, thank you all so much for this important proclamation. And now I'd like to turn it over to a tremendous leader and the only woman on this council, Councilmember Navarro, to make some important comments as well. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. And I want to thank Ms. Agoti and Ms. Valerian and Ms. Finkelstein for your extraordinary track record of, of work in this space. Um, this is a county council that has a history of always standing up for women's rights, especially when it comes to reproductive justice. And as you have all eloquently stated, uh, it seems like the more things change, the more they stay the same and the more that we have to continue to fight. Uh, it is clear, especially today with everything that we're going through with this pandemic, that sometimes it is hard to focus on all the things that are occurring, but this is a major threat and very important uh, that the awareness is raised. Uh, no woman ever wants to be faced with this particular choice. Uh, this idea that somehow this is something that everyone just wants to do, <laughs> it is absolutely false. But the reality is that we need to make sure that women have the ability and the right to determine uh, what is in the best interest of her health and her body. And this is absolutely critical. So I want to thank you all for all this work. Yes, 49 years, but we must continue to fight and fight real hard. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando, for bringing this forward. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Everyone. President. Uh, this was an important moment. And Ms. Finkelstein, thank you and the Commission for all your continued leadership and work. We appreciate you all so much. We're now going to move on to general business. Uh, we have a lot to get through today. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any announcements? Good morning, Mr. President, council members. We have one announcement. 
the public hearings on the FY23 capital budget and FY23 to 28 capital improvements program will be held on Tuesday, February 8th, 2022 at 1.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. and Wednesday, February 9th, 2022 at 1.30 p.m. The council has not received any petitions, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The clerk has also circulated the minutes of November 29th, 30th, and December 6th for approval. Are there any changes from my colleagues? Hearing none, then by application, uh, th those are now approved. Um, we are now going to move to sit as the, the so the approval of the minutes are, are uh, noted for the record. We are now going to sit as the Board of Health uh, and receive several updates this morning, as well as hold a public hearing uh, regarding the proposed vaccine uh, mandate by the county executive. Um, colleagues, we have a, a tight morning. Um, so let me make just a couple of housekeeping announcements here. We will first hear, sitting as the Board of Health, from our colleagues in Montgomery County Public Schools, as well as the Board of Education. Uh, we've allocated at least an hour uh, for that discussion. And so we will uh, humbly request that the five minute rule apply in terms of Q&A and acknowledge that the Education and Culture Committee will have an expanded session to further dive into issues regarding COVID. Uh, and Councilmember Rice will make a formal announcement about that session and lay some forth some expectations for that session uh, when we begin the Q&A portion of uh, the discussion this morning. We then have a public hearing and a number of speakers uh, who would like to speak to uh, the vaccine mandate, again, as proposed by the county executive uh, and now being considered by us sitting as the Board of Health. And then we will have uh, an update from our colleagues on the public health team on the current situation on the ground before us. Um, so with that, uh, I wanna welcome our colleagues from Montgomery County Public Schools. I just wanna say a few general comments before we get started on this important item uh, on the agenda. Uh, and just acknowledge the challenges and just historical challenges that the school system has faced these last several weeks. Uh, the personnel challenges, the operational challenges, while being faced by every school jurisdiction across the country, that doesn't make it any easier for us here in the county. This council has heard from thousands of county residents as well as staff and personnel and administrators and support staff from our schools, uh, all expressing some degree of uh, exhaustion, uh, frustration to some level. And we know that our colleagues in MCPS are continuing as they have all along to do their best given the uh, just extraordinarily difficult circumstances before us right now. Um, I do appreciate that uh, there has been adjustments as information has become available as operational decisions have come into focus. Uh, and I know that there are ongoing efforts as we speak to try our best to address the issues that are on the ground before us right now. We've heard from county residents and families uh, who have just passionately and emotionally advocated that our schools remain open because of the emotional toll, because of the academic gaps that have occurred within our school system. We have also heard equally emotional uh, and, and very passionate advocacy that there be a pause or that we look at the current operation on the ground uh, and give us an opportunity to catch our breath. We know that the school system has been wrestling with all of that and we look forward to hearing an update from them this morning and then there will be questions and answers from my colleagues. Uh, so with that, Dr. McKnight, I now turn it over to you uh, to make a presentation. Uh, and then uh, my colleague and friend, Chairman Rice, will be first up uh, for the Q&A, but to also lay the context for the longer session that we will be having after that. So with that, Dr. McKnight, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Council President Albernaz. Um, I am here with our board president, Ms. Brenda Wolf, and members of the staff. And I'll actually let, uh, turn it over to Ms. Wolf, who can uh, add some additional comments for us before we get into discussion. Ms. Wolf? Thank you, Dr. McKnight. And good morning, President Albernaz and members of the County Council. On behalf of the Montgomery County Board of Education, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and our community this morning. First, I would like to acknowledge and express my appreciation for how deeply all of our students, staff, 
parents, elected officials, and community care about our school system. The passionate advocacy on behalf of students and families is a great asset to our community. Our families count on the Board of Education and the leadership of MCPS to make the right decisions to provide an outstanding teaching and learning experience in a safe environment. This pandemic has challenged our ability to operate normally. The challenges and obstacles have shifted and evolved as the pandemic transformed into an endemic. So we continue to navigate these turbulent waters. But I wanna caution though, not all people in the county feel passionately about the way to proceed. There's no central agreement, but we do all agree that we want to do what is best for the students of this county. So while it is important to really listen to a vast array of voices, it is imperative that the school system keep our mission to educate students at the forefront. I ask everybody today to listen, understand, and share perspectives from a place of collective commitment. Let's listen closely to what the health experts say. Let's listen closely to what the education experts say. And let's listen closely to what the operational experts say. The Board of Education is committed to an open conversation and the necessary hard work. Thank you. Thank you, President Wolf. I appreciate those comments. Dr. McKnight. You are on mute, Dr. McKnight. There you go. You would think almost after two years, <laughs> this wouldn't happen as often. Uh, but again, thank you all so much for inviting us here today and being a part of this conversation. Um, I too just wanna begin with my thanks. Uh, President Albernoff, Vice President Glass, uh, Education and Culture Committee Chair, Council Member Rice, um, I think it's really important for all of us to stay close and continue to have an ongoing conversation about this. Our community still tends to manage through all the needs of COVID-19. And the more often we're able to come together and provide updates as we're doing this morning, it's going to create an opportunity for us to continue to have ongoing work and most importantly, be able to respond in real time to the needs, especially given the dramatic increase in COVID-19 cases and as often as a new variant comes along and then we have to adjust and pivot. I too wanna to begin by saying I am deeply appreciative to the leaders of our county as well as our families. This pandemic has taken a lot of patience, more patience than any of us ever thought we would have needed or would have ever required working through this. But here we are um, 20 months later and we are still in many cases managing uh, a lot of different things that require that we have to shift and make adjustments. And I will say, as I sit and talk with you this morning, like any educator across America, I will tell you the challenges that are presented by COVID-19 are like anything our school system have ever, has ever experienced. And I will venture to say any school system has experienced in modern history. We're all first timers at this, and we're going to continue to learn, grow, and adjust. And that is the commitment I make to you and to our community that we will continue to work together and work through these circumstances. And even in the face of these circumstances, I will say it has not been difficult, but I do wanna pause for a second and just have us talk about what MCPS has consistently done and the decisions that have been made that have served our students in their best interests and have also constantly been aligned to our core values. Our core values on relationships, respect, equity, excellence, and learning. And those are the core values that the staff and I continue to come back and talk about as we think about what decisions are we making and how are those decisions impacting every single student and family in the system. And in a diverse community where there are many various uh, needs that, are, that, are, uh, that have to be made in consideration of how we support the families, we have to be very intentional and very personalized in how we do that. In fact, on many fronts, I will venture to say, yes, we've had a lot of pivoting and learning to do, but MCBS in many ways have been a leader in response to this pandemic. And I will just name a few things. First, we were able to offer the largest summer school program in the history as a part of our work to mitigate learning disruption. And I don't wanna make that a small contribution because we saw others struggling to do it. 
But again, I'm going to lay into it was because of the staff who were tired and exhausted that they were able to commit to coming back and us serving over 53,000 students in our summer, pro summer school program this past year, all to mitigate learning disruption. And that's to be applauded. We were also one of the first school systems to present a comprehensive plan for providing instruction to students in quarantine. And this was not one that was built on simultaneous instruction, which we heard our staff say is the not the best way to be able to personalize learning for our students. I have consistently said this and I am deeply committed to doing everything that we can to keep our school system open for in-person learning, but doing so safely. And I think about that often as I consider what are the decisions that are best for the school system, because the school system is one part of this entire county. A big part of it, but one part. So with that, that's what the data tells us is best for student learning to stay committed to being uh, focused on what do we do to make sure the health and safety of our students is at the forefront while we also balance the commitment to make sure our students are learning. And we know that <laughs> education is a, is, a, is a profession that is absolutely relationship-based and it's a face-to-face -face enterprise. And honestly, there is no replacement to that. And when we do have to replace it to a virtual format, we have to be very thoughtful about what are the consequences of that and how do we best do that and what makes us say that is necessary at this time. And for 209 schools, personalizing that decision is going to be key. So we're continuing to pre preserve that in-person learning environment that has been a tremendous effort led by the amazing staff who work in the school system. As with other school systems, you know, our operations have been impacted by staffing shortages. And we saw that up front, more specifically with the Omicron variant. Our schools report to the uh, Office of Teaching and Learning and schools on a daily basis where their most critical needs are. And then again, speaking to our staff, our central office staff have been going out to schools to cover classes, to monitor lunch, to answer phones, whatever is needed to help that school operate. And that's our starting point. If we're able to help a school be able to operate, and we have many valuable staff who are in our central office, who at most times in their career have served as those teachers and they step in to help. So these are all of the, 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 the opportunities that we put in place before we get to a decision of having to move a school to virtual. And then we also continue to explore ways in which we can alleviate those shortage, those uh, shortage challenges as well. And we open up the year with shortage challenges. And so when a new variant comes along and impacts us, it puts us in a very um, unique circumstance. So for an example, we just came to an agreement with Montgomery County uh, Education Association, MCA, this month on increase in pay for substitute teachers with an increase across the board for all categories of substitute teachers. So our substitute teacher rate continues to be among the very highest throughout the metropolitan area and state. And we know that we needed to do that because we need substitutes to come in and help us when our teachers and our staff have to be out. And to cite one specific category, short-term substitute, uh, certified substitute teachers, they're gonna receive an increase of 7%, which translates into about being paid $150 a day or $21 per hour. And in addition, we're also now paying substitutes a $40 stipend to cover additional classes beyond the five periods that they normally cover um, for a secondary teacher. So again, I share those examples with you because I recognize that there have been and will continue to be times when health or operational reasons are going to compromise the benefits of in-person learning to such an extent that it makes sense for the school to transition to virtual learning for a defined period of time. As in the case with many other uh, large school systems across the country, we have not established specific thresholds for automatically transitioning schools to virtual learning. What we have done, what we have collaborated on is rather outlined at the Board of Education last week when we met on Thursday, we outlined a plan that includes multiple factors that we're gonna to continue to consider using a collaborative process for making those decisions. We are examining the key areas of staff absences, student absences, unfilled substitute teacher positions, unserved bus routes, and COVID-19 case rates among students and staff. And when you look at all of these different factors across our schools, which is why we are using them to help paint a picture of a school rather than a one-off switch. For example, one school that has a trend of more than 20% of staff absent may be able to function safely and effectively, whereas another school may not, depending on who those staff members are, 
who are able to be in the building and who aren't and how that relates to key functioning of a school. I'll also give another example. When a school is in high, when a, um, when a school is in a high multiple area compared with other schools, we also continue to make that commitment to confer, collaborate, and talk with the Department of Health and Human Services where appropriate. And then a team convenes to include the principal, staff representative, parent leaders in that school, and central office representatives. This group is well equipped to assess what they know to be true about the realities on the ground in specific school communities. That team will review all of the data for the individual school and make a recommendation to the superintendent's cabinet about whether a school should transition to virtual learning for a period of 10 calendar days. Now, I wanna just speak to that very quickly for a moment. I know there have been questions about there being a threshold and there being a specific uh, count that needs to be connected to a school. What percent is this counting for towards COVID cases and staff absences? We have 209 schools, and if we were to come up with a criteria, that criteria is not going to speak to what the circumstances are in a small school, what the circum how the cir circumstances differ for a large school, and all of the other things that really personalize what does a specific school, a specific program, a specific uh, circumstance at a school need so that we can have flexibility. And quite frankly, with those schools team, again, the parent representative, the administration, the school staff members, if they are looking at their own numbers and evaluating those numbers, that's the school community that's ultimately gonna be impacted by this decision. So if that team, which represents all voices of that particular school are well-grounded in how that data contributes to them making a decision about whether we need to stay in school at this moment in in-person learning, or if we need to switch to virtual for 10 days, that's the community who needs to know and understand that and can make sense of those numbers, which may not make sense when they, those numbers are transferred to another school who may be in a completely different circumstance. So I elevate that because as we think about transparency, it's almost about who needs that level of transparency and why. And to me, involving all of those stakeholders and looking at that data and understanding it matters to that particular school who is impacted. And let's also keep in mind that school principals can elevate their schools for collaborative consideration if a possible transition to virtual learning, even if the central collected data does not identify that school. So we at central office can look at a myriad of data and say, okay, based on all of the factors, the five factors that I've mentioned, this school on paper looks like it needs to transition to virtual for 10 days. But sometimes the story cannot be told through looking at just plain numbers. And so again, thinking about how that flexibility has to come in place when we're thinking about students, families, and all of their circumstances, we also know that we want to give our principals flexibility to say, well, why the, the, the story of my school did not elevate into numbers, but I think there needs to be a conversation about how we are struggling to operate or that we can't operate. We have that option. So again, elevating that we have one process that we look at centrally that helps us look at who we need to make a recommendation to or engage principals in what is going on because the numbers seem to, to, to uh, make us ask questions about your level of operation, but also knowing that principals have flexibility with that. So with that said, the first round of that process started on Friday after our board meeting on Thursday. And later today, we're gonna be announcing some schools that will transition to virtual learning for 10 calendar days beginning this Thursday, January 20th. And I recognize that some families are concerned about sending their students to school due to high COVID-19 rates in our community. At the Board of Education on Thursday, we announced plans to provide virtual instructional opportunities to students in these situations. And we're gonna excuse their absences because we can do that. And that allows families to have some flexibility until the end of the month to say if they'd like to take advantage of those virtual opportunities. And if, they, if we need to extend after looking at what the needs of our communities are, we'll do that. So we have that option available. And in our quest to maintain in-person learning to the, to the greatest extent possible, I am coming to you today with two specific requests that I believe are gonna make a tremendous difference for our schools. What I may have come to you and presented in terms of needs in September would be very different than today. Now that we've been in school for a full semester in-person learning, and now we've moved through two variants. But there are two things that still remain very consistent and clear to me that we need help with. 
and I want to share those with you. The first is that I'm requesting that we get the support to assume the support from government agency, mainly maybe the Department of Health and Human Services, to assume all responsibility for contact tracing in our schools. Our school administrators and our staff have been managing this responsibility throughout the year, and we've heard repeatedly it is taken away from their ability to focus on instruction. We've heard this from every single association because contact tracing is taking up the work and the time of the principal, the assistant principal, the main office uh, support staff, the counselors, essentially everyone who is not standing in front of a student teaching them. Everyone's doing contact tracing. And in order for us to truly get to mitigating learning disruption, we need that responsibility to be taken away and managed by another department so that we can truly focus on that. And quite frankly, when you really think about contact tracing, that's very relevant to those who work in that area of expertise. Yes, our staff have been doing it. They have learned how to do it. They've probably become more familiar with this process than they'd like. And that's because we do what we need to do. However, we also recognize that we have got to get back to school. And there are some things now that we've learned Quite frankly, contact tracing has been happening since last March when we initially returned students in the spring, and it's still taking an enormous amount of time that's taken away from the focus of what we need to have happen in schools. The second request that I'm making today is that the county government provide MCPS with 190,000 rapid kits each every other week. The reason I'm asking for that is so that we can provide a kit to every single student and every single staff member. This has always been our plan. We started that process two weeks ago when we started to administer the testing kits to every student and every staff. But we also know this is an increased operational process that requires that we procure, we go and work with all these companies to figure out how we can get tests. Might I mention at the same time that every single school system in this nation is working with their health department or whomever in trying to secure these same tests. That is an added responsibility that is really significant on our operational function, when there are many other operational functions that we need to be spending our time looking at that gets at the basis of how do we make sure we're continuing to hire and recruit in an environment where labor has been the forefront of one of the biggest challenges that we have? How can we make sure that we're continuing to look at the state of our building and our ventilation systems and continuing to update them as we have been doing to make sure we're creating our school spaces to be safe and healthy in so many different ways? All of this is to mitigate the measures that's going to help ensure the safety of our schools and students. And at this moment for COVID-19, but for any other circumstance, operational circumstance that may come up that we are not thinking about because we now have to predict for the future. So I just wanted to share those with you and be very specific about why we are here today, sharing with you what we've done and how we've addressed the concerns of our community to provide options so that we, our families can exercise that. And I just want to end by saying, I appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you today and for the support that you've provided to our students and staff. I continue to say we're in this together. This is something that we have to do together, but we have to think about what all of our uh, responsibilities are as a government to invest and wrap our arms around a school system that really needs to get focused on those areas that have truly impacted our students from this pandemic now going on two years. And we need to be serious about it and be timely about it. So I just want to thank you. Many of you have reached out. You've asked questions. You continue to ask what, what, can, what, what can be done to help us. And so I wanted to be very specific with that. Um, there's a tremendous amount of work happening to ensure that our schools can operate safely and effectively, and we will continue to make decisions in the best interest of students and staff. So I will stop there, and uh, the staff and I are prepared to take any questions that you may have. Okay, uh, colleagues. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. So. Um, uh, most of my colleagues have understandably requested to speak. I'll just once again note uh, that we will have an expanded conversation on this critically important issue tomorrow, which Council Chair Chairman Rice will soon describe. Uh, in the queue are first Chairman Rice, uh, followed by Councilmember Hucker, then Councilmember Jawando, then Councilmember Reamer, and Councilmember Navarro, and then Council Vice President Glass. Uh, Chairman Rice. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, before Vice President Glass is Councilmember Friedson. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I want to thank uh, both the president of the Board of Education, uh, Ms. Wolf, as well as Dr. McKnight, 
uh, for your presentation this morning, but also your continued partnership. Uh, many people don't realize that the council uh, works behind the scenes each and every day to make things happen. Uh, and we don't have to post it on Twitter or on Facebook or on Instagram uh, for us to have discussions. Uh, and those discussions have continued throughout this pandemic since the very beginning. And I really wanna thank you for the partnership, but I wanna just make sure that folks understand uh, that just because I don't tweet about something doesn't mean that it's not happening. Uh, and I think that again, the continued conversations we have between board leadership, between our leadership, you know, I was talking to the council president a couple days ago uh, about some of the challenges that we continue to face. These are things that are incredibly important to us and matter. Um, but we as government elected officials have to make sure that we're doing our part to answer the clarion call of what is it that we need to do to ensure that we can keep our kids in school, but do so safely for both the students as well as the staff and administrators that are in the building. That is our objective. And we learned quite quickly from uh, the first run of the pandemic about what that challenge meant. Uh, the challenges that we faced in standing up hubs in communities to make sure that we dealt with some of the learning gaps that we knew would exist, the technology challenges that we had in rolling out MiFi devices and individual dev uh, devices for uh, folks. Those are all things that still haven't gone away. As I led the broadband uh, task force for the National Association of Counties in exploring the digital divide, folks, it still exists. Uh, even though uh, there's money that's been allocated by the federal government, many of these things will take years uh, to make sure that we're trying to upend uh, many of those disconnects. And I say that because those are the reasons why, the same reasons why we were fighting to get our kids back into school are the same reasons why we're trying to do everything we possibly can to keep our kids in school now. And I know that that concerns some parents uh, who are certainly uh, rightfully worried about the health and safety of their children. I too, as a parent, as many folks on this council are parents, uh, have children in Montgomery County Public Schools. And I worry each and every day that my lovely daughter goes to school, uh, that she protects herself and will come home safe uh, and won't be infected with a virus that could potentially uh, be uh, health challenging for her. I've seen it enough in my family and don't need any more of that right now. And so from my standpoint, I think that the school system uh, has done a great job in trying to come up with ways in which we can accomplish that, and it's not easy. Many times they've been stalwarted by the state uh, that has said that no, this policy does not adhere uh, to what their guidelines are, but we shouldn't criticize them for trying to do something that we know was trying to achieve the ultimate goal keeping our kids in school while doing so safely. The red, green, and yellow that uh, the school system presented was something that was embraced by this council, uh, that was embraced by all of us thinking that this may be a way for us to certainly ensure that we can understand uh, what it was that our schools were doing in terms of mitigating risk uh, and identifying those that were at higher risk. And so therefore, those would be the ones that would consider being closed. It was the state that decided that that could no longer move forward. So let me be clear, this wasn't something that MCPS decided, oh, well, we're not gonna do it any longer. Uh, they were given guidance from the state that they were not allowed to do that. Now, again, we've asked for waivers and I wanna uh, uh, tell Council Member Duano who's just asked for another waiver. We've asked for so many different waivers and everything that is state policy that's keeping us from being able to be more flexible and be more creative about ways in which we can achieve that ultimate goal. All of those discussions will be had uh, at our uh, Education and Culture Committee meeting uh, on Wednesday. Uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, things that we've attempted, as well as some of the new and innovative approaches that MCPS continues to devise to try and do just that. Keep in mind that when people say that uh, the goalposts are moving, they are. Um, and the goalposts are being moved by the state every single day in terms of us coming up with different ways in which we can try and approach uh, and address the situation, but then are told, no, that doesn't work, that's not okay. And then when asked for guidance at both the state and federal level, I was just in a meeting with the White House the other day, 
and I asked the question, what are the suggested matrix for when a school should close due to a COVID outbreak? No one could answer. When we asked state government, what are the suggested metrics for when a school should close due to a COVID outbreak? There is no answer. Keep in mind, this is what school systems across this nation, not just Montgomery County Public Schools, continue to be challenged with. Coupled with the staffing shortages, all of those things are the things that we need to have to be able to understand what's going on with our system. So, in closing, those are the things that we're going to be able to discuss on Wednesday with our school system in great detail uh, about what those staffing models are, what happens when we have these two different silos, one that involves in person, as well as one that would involve a virtual learning environment. And then what MCPS has set up as the way in which we're going to address and ensure that all of our kids are still connected to learning. So I apologize, Mr. President, for taking a little bit longer than the five minutes, but I thought it was important to level set where we are at this point and what we'll specifically be discussing in terms of those details around those two silos. One for in-person learning and how we're gonna keep kids safe doing that. And the other being, if a school went to virtual, what that would be in terms of setting up to ensure that there's not minimal learning loss, if any at all, and making sure that our children remain connected uh, throughout that process. The ultimate goal is for us to have a seamless integration of both of those procedures to make sure that our kids have everything that they need to be successful. So back to you, sir. Thank you, Chairman Rice. And that will be at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, all right, Council Member Hucker. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President, and uh, um, appreciate the comments by uh, Chairman Rice and looking forward to tomorrow's discussion as well. Um, Dr. McKnight and your team, thank you so much for this briefing. I've learned a lot. Um, thank you so much for holding the town hall last week. Um, I think honestly that it's it's excellent to hear you make these specific requests of the county government and HHS in particular. The problems in HHS during this very difficult time have put you in a very difficult position for quite a while. And many parents that I talk to all the time don't understand what HHS's role is versus your role. You're not health professionals and you rely on our county health professionals. Um, is it, with that sort of in mind, um, is it true that HHS hasn't briefed the board in 13 months? Council Member Hucker, uh, I wanna make sure we address your question specifically. When you said DHHS briefed the board, do you mean having a public board dis a discussion publicly with the Board of Education? Yeah, and the guidance that they're sharing with the board so board members can help you make, uh, understand the decisions you're making and help you make their decisions about keeping our students and staff safe. Sure, so I do wanna acknowledge that we do share with the board all of the collaboration efforts that we have with DHHS. I mentioned we have a meeting with them every week, sometimes multiple times a week, depending on the situation, every day. So those efforts continue to occur. In terms of a full briefing to the Board of Education, um, there has not been a briefing, but I also want to acknowledge that, you know, we, we that's something that can happen um, with the specific request from the Board of Education. We've never not had them agree to not come for a briefing. Um, so sure. if, if that's requested, I'm sure that can happen. I, I just know I appreciate the importance of the, you know, daily or, or uh, you know, very often staff level briefings. I just, having been been elected official for a long time. I know it's really important to hear things from the horse's mouth and be able to ask questions ourselves. And and uh, I, I I know I, I, my colleagues on the on the board of ed would probably appreciate the chance to talk to HHS you know often. Um, uh, I really appreciate your request for HHS to handle all the contact tracing. Um, it's not your job. It never was your job. Principals and teachers and support staff. Um, they're all committed pr professionals in my experience, and they always do what needs to be done, usually without complaining. Um, they always fill in, but they shouldn't be forced to do that indefinitely. Um, they shouldn't have to do the job of HHS staff. Um, and, and, and having that system in place indefinitely, to me, is really unfair to them, and it's unwise and unworkable, you know, uh, in terms of running the school as well. So I'm really glad you, you've made that request, and also that you've made the request to have 190,000 rapid test kits every week. Our schools should have always had enough test kits. Um, um, so thank you for making that that clear today. Um, along those lines, um, what's your view on why not move to opt out rather than opt in? So we have more and more of our students being tested. Thank you. I will refer that question uh, to our uh, general counsel, Stephanie Williams. 
this is a conversation we've had uh, in a number of different forms, but right. Ms. Williams can share it best. Ms. Williams? Yes, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to, to help provide some clarity on this issue. Um, Maryland law requires all medical providers to obtain parental consent before, before providing any type of medical service or procedure on a minor. So MCPS is actually assisting the testing providers um, by collecting the permission from the parents. We cannot give the testing providers our par parents' contact information um, uh, because of student um, st record protection requirements. So they don't have a way of reaching each of the parents. So, so we are taking on, we have taken on that role and we're required to do so of participating in the MSDE uh, testing grant program. Um. Thank you. I, I just heard, I, I appreciate your point of, your legal point of view on that. I've heard different information from MDH and the governor's office. So I, I'm just hopeful that we'll sort of get all the parties um, in the same room to, to work that out because I think everybody would agree that we'd have a lot more data coming in and a lot more children protected um, if we go to opt out rather than opt in. And better yet, why not do what Baltimore's doing right now and DC's doing right now, just requiring a negative test to enter school? I'm not a doctor, but all of us understand. Um, I thought infectious disease 101 was separate the infectious people from the non-infectious people. And when you walk in a school in Baltimore or DC, you get a negative test, you move on to, to the classroom. If you have a positive test, you go home and recuperate. I don't understand why we wouldn't be doing that in Montgomery County. Council member Hucker. Um, I'm glad you brought up those examples of what's happening in other places, because when we use the word required, we have to talk about what that means. And I mean, one thing I'll say is because everybody's trying to figure out how they're working through these issues. Sure. I know I'm personally constantly collaborating with leaders in those other districts. So let's use uh, DC, for example. So yes, they did require everyone take the test. Well, as we would know, everyone would not take the test. Uh, everyone did not submit the, the response to the test. So then they then had to set up testing sites within the schools for those students to be tested. So here again, we're not opposed to being able to provide tests to whoever need them if we don't have the information. Mm -hmm. What I'm highlighting to the council today is that cannot continue to be in going on two years, the responsibility of the school system to organize. 100% um, And agree. so I, I share that with you because um, it, it, it's, it's sometimes that's a perfect example where we can require, but we're expected to provide a fair and equitable education to every child. And nor do I want to set up a circumstance in which a student for, you know, and families who are navigating different circumstances don't have that. Um, however, there's another part to it, which means if they can't do it or if they don't do it, then how do we have structure set up for that to occur? And I do want to acknowledge, as Council Member uh, Rice mentioned, he and Council Member Jawando, there are, I mean, many of you who are out there serving as advocates on behalf of the school system to the state and in other places saying, how can we get that guidance and how can we get uh, some of the things that we are requesting in place so that we can have consistency? And I do believe that's important. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Council Member Hawker. Council Member Jawanda. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the, the tee up from the superintendent there. Um, and I appreciate all the work you're doing. You're getting caught up, you and your staff, I'm glad they're all, many of them are here, many behind you, uh, in one of the most difficult situations that's ever confronted public education. Uh, just like we as council members, I don't think any of us got our handbook on day one and said we were going to do pandemic duty and decide what closes and what opens and how we did this. And it's very difficult. So I want to just acknowledge that again. And I think we're doing, we're coming from a place of wanting all kids to learn wanting all families to be supported. Uh, we've done amazing things with feeding families in the summer learning. You know, we're a model. And it's, it's when you're a model, people want you to get everything right. And it's difficult to do that. And, uh, you know, having, I worked uh, for Barack Obama when he was president, and he was going to part the seas, heal the, heal the oceans, and bring everything back together. It was an unrealistic expectation, uh, but it was a hope that was needed at the time. Uh, and MCPS uh, is a great system, and we have a great track record, uh, and we're, just like everyone else, continuous improvement. So I just want to acknowledge that. And I think 
I would caution any elected official uh, on anybody uh, from getting you and the work that you all are doing caught up in the political firestorm of back and forth. I'm just, I'm really, really sick of it. Uh, everyone here is trying to help kids and to help families. Um, and, you know, let's focus on that. Let's not focus on assigning blame. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Let's get the things right. Let's help you do your job. I appreciate those two requests. Um, where I have a sign-on letter uh, that was mentioned, alluded to by Councilmember Rice, and I and I got everyone. I, I actually need Councilmember Hucker's uh, sign off on it, uh, and a couple of others that we're going to send to the governor. And we've been working on this for a few weeks, asking for the him to use his executive power and authority to allow you to do in-school testing and get more data and to do opt-out. That will double, you know, the amount of information we get. It'll help us keep our kids safe. Those who are uh, immunocompromised. I've heard from so many parents who just have not been sending their kids to school because they're worried about the transmission uh, for our immunocompromised and other kids. So it would be a great tool, but we can't do it without the governor's uh, authority. Um, and so I appreciate working with Stephanie Williams, your general counsel, and others to clear that up. Uh, and that letter hopefully will go out later today. Um, it's a one example of we have to work with the system we're in. Um, and we're the 14th, 15th largest school district in the country. It's very difficult. Um, we have to have the tests, and you shouldn't be doing contract testing. I'm very appreciative of those two direct things. We need You need support on that, and we need to have enough tests if we do. The worst thing to happen is we switch, get the authority, and we don't have enough tests to test kids in school with enough people to test kids in school. So let's, let's make sure that we have that in place, uh, and we're going to be a partner with you to work uh, to make sure you have that capacity. Um, and let's keep innovating. I've heard from teachers, if a school does get shut down for the reasons you talked about, uh, staff absences, bus routes, COVID cases, the whole holistic picture, let's allow our educators uh, to do the virtual instruction from home. Let's take some stress off of their plate. Uh, that's something that you know I've heard as, a, as an example of something that we could provide some flexibility on that we can control. Let's, let's continue to do those things. Let's work as good partners with everyone who's included. Um, and I know you all are trying to do that. And uh, this is more of a statement than a question because I'll I will get into the I'll be at the session on the ENC committee tomorrow with my colleagues to dive into how we're going to do these things. But I just want to say I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, let's let's focus on the goal. Everyone wants our kids to be safe, to learn, uh, and to help be a part of our community fight against COVID-19. And and I know that's the spirit in which we're coming to us today and that we're having this discussion. So thank you. And I yield the rest of my time, Mr. President. Thank you. Next, we have Council Member Reamer, followed by Council Member Navarro, then Council Member Friedson, then Council Vice President Glass, and then Council Member Katz. Council Member Reamer. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. McKnight, for being with us today and, and everyone. And I, I appreciated uh, your request to the county. Um, uh, there's just First of all, I want to I want to thank you for your comments today in support of in person education. Um, you know, uh, as a parent and and as a elected official, I think one of the hardest things over the past several years has been seeing the impact on children, the the lack of learning, you know, the lack of progression. And to be here in January, once again, facing massive disruption to learning is it's heartbreaking. And I, I, I want to say clearly that whether a school is virtual or in person right now, I think is a minor difference <laughs> in the sense that there's going to be massive disruption. But I do think that maintaining our commitment to education is a bigger question right now for this community. And I think that requires us to hold fast with in-person, unless, as you explained, there are certain conditions in a school that render it, you know, impossible. And, you know, and under those circumstances, of course, you know, you, you can't operate a school if the staff are not able to be in the building to teach. And so, you know, having that school-by-school -school assessment, I think, is the appropriate and pragmatic way to think about this. Uh, to retain our commitment overall to in-person um, and, you know, to, to reassure the community that we're not, uh, you know, that 
that is our priority is to keep kids in person. Um, you know, I, I've seen it in my household, you know, the impact of extended virtual. I'm a parent of two MCPS students. Um, I, you know, and I just, the, the, I think the thought of an extended closure is terrifying to many. And I, I, what we don't know about this wave is how quickly it might subside. And so, you know, the idea that we would have started off January in a full virtual transition, you know, but what if the, what if the transmission hadn't subsided after two weeks, which it hasn't, I mean, it actually, well, it is subsiding, but it is not down to a level that it corresponds to anything like what we saw at earlier stages. Although the science is showing that Omicron is not as dangerous for children. And that is a really, really important thing for our community to digest, you know, that children, children are at less risk from Omicron on an individual basis than previous variants, although, of course, we're seeing that we're all more likely to get Omicron. But if you're vaccinated and boosted, your success, you know, in the face of getting an infection is is overwhelming, uh, you know. So um, I, I want to, again, I think we've got to have that refined school by school approach. I'm glad for the decision that you've also made to allow in secondary schools for teachers to zoom in students as appropriate, you know, if their family is at high risk. I mean, I, I always have to qualify my strong support for in-person with the recognition that their families with very, you know, older members of the household or highly compromised members of the household, and they need to be able to get an education also. And so by allowing for that on a limited basis as, as medically necessary, you know, I, I think that you're providing a, a solution there. You know, what we're seeing from like the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania is a shift towards just managing symptomatic cases and, and you know, dealing with it on that basis in the schools and trying to contact trace thousands of cases is, is extremely difficult. And it may not... You know, it's it's there's a there's a tornado that's hitting the house. You know, it's sort of like trying to put the dishes away. You know, it it's just there there's so much going on. So I, I hear your request to shift that responsibility, and I think that's appropriate. And I think that HHS ought to make a determination as to what is really feasible and what is necessary. You know, in this kind of wave, um, you know, versus more targeted outbreaks you know, where tracing can really help you get to the bottom of, uh, you know, a situation and then and then address it and stop it. Um, it's a little harder to do when you have transmission at the level that we're at, uh, at this, you know, have been and, and, and would are now. So, um, you know, we've got to get focused on how to help kids accelerate on their path. We can't stop the impact that has happened. And, you know, we've got to look at a multi-year strategy here to hire and staff the schools. We've got to pay our paras and our other per personnel competitively. I am disturbed by the competitive pay that I see in many of these positions. And uh, it seems, you know, that must be part of the problem in our ability to attract staff into these critical roles. But we've got to get to hiring these positions as quickly as possible. And we've got to, you know, supplement what MCPS does. I think that's our big challenge as a county now. The next couple of years is going to be to supplement what MCPS can do to bring all hands on deck so that these kids are no longer behind in reading and they're no longer behind in math. You know, there's probably nothing more important for us to do. So you know, we all need to pull together here in this county behind education. And I think our, our commitment has been tested. Um, but if we can focus here, maintain our support for in person, while at the same time providing that nuanced, refined school-by-school -school approach that recognizes actual impacts on staff um, and you know, keep our public support going so that we can make the investments that we need in the coming years to, to get out of this. That, that's kind of my general feeling about all of this. And uh, um, you know, so Dr. McKnight, anything you'd like to say you know, in response, uh, I'd appreciate it. Otherwise, I'll pass the mic to my next colleague. I'm pleased to say that. Thank you, Councilman Reamer. I, I appreciate your comments and everything that you've said. 
and the school system uh, aligns very much in terms of what we've presented to our community along the lines of exactly what you've said. One should not compromise the other, but we do need to find what it is that every family needs, every unique uh, situation and circumstance needs while making the commitment to be safe and healthy, but honoring in-person learning. Two years, shame on us <laughs> if we haven't figured out how to make that happen. And that's why we're here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so, um, President Wolf and Superintendent, Acting Superintendent McKnight, and all of you on this call from MCPS, the central staff, teachers, paraeducators, administrators, I, I want to say thank you. Um, I, I, I keep going back to this place of uh, having to step back to understand what it is that we're seeing. And some of you have mentioned, you know, two years, two years. The reality is that there is no way that anybody could have predicted and also uh, fooled themselves to think that we would be facing such disruption uh, and somehow pretend that we could expect outcomes to be the same that they were before the pandemic. It's just impossible. This particular wave obviously has been different, different than the others, because as has been stated in some of the reports that perhaps is not as um, as lethal or or as, as, you know, especially for those who are vaccinated, the disruption in terms of staffing across the board has been extraordinary. And so now we are dealing with the health um, uh, uh, concerns and challenges, but we're also dealing with the disruption in systems. And for a school system like MCPS of over 160,000 students, it's such a diverse system with a very large concentration of students who are affected by poverty. Just imagine the task of very quickly identifying a fast moving target and then respond to it when staff is being affected. And so I just you know, I just want to say that to me, the word grace comes to mind all the time. Like we need a little bit of more, we need more grace uh, as we deal with all of these challenges. Um, more grace to understand that parents are understandably so in a really, really, really frustrated, frustrating situation. Um, understanding that there are a lot of low income parents that perhaps we don't even hear from uh, who are struggling so hard, uh, understanding that all of us have vowed to uh, take our roles very seriously, and we want to do everything possible to make sure that our children and families are safe and are learning. And so I really want to, um, you know, just, just express my appreciation to everyone, to the parents, to the staff, to everyone, and please understand that we have got to, because that is our responsibility as leaders, we have got to figure out how to constantly enhance our communication, but also assess what might be different when we get into these, what have now become rolling crises. Um, and so thank you for identifying those two requests. Um, I would say to my colleagues that, you know, I'm reminded of what we had to do in 2020. There's no doubt that this budget we're going to have to look at it from a very different perspective that perhaps we were prepared to do, because we may have to prioritize a lot of things that we didn't think we needed to prioritize uh, in terms of just how to respond to what's happening. Um, and no doubt that I don't know how we can, with a straight face, say that even when students come into the classroom, that they're going to be receiving the same level of instruction. It's going to be very different which calls for this innovation piece. And what gives me some uh, comfort is that we have had put in place in the past a lot of initiatives that have been innovative in nature, right? The Bell Program, you know, the Equity Hubs, and there's just a lot that we've done before. So assessing all of this to figure out what is the best way to mitigate, it's going to be critical. And therefore, again, we may have to look at the budget from a different lens that we have had even last year to quickly try to make up for a lot of this. Um, so just to say thank you, obviously, I will 
um, I'm a member of the Education and Culture Committee as well, so I will be uh, there um, hearing and also hopefully uh, exchanging ideas as to how we can best support you uh, and support our parents and our children. Um, but more than anything, again, I go back to this notion of just, you know, practicing a little bit more of grace and not just going down this rabbit hole of just blame, you know, <laughs> blaming and, 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 and just, you know, incendiary things, et cetera. We need to come together uh, to ride this particular wave and be ready to pivot again if it comes our way again in a different fashion. But we can do this, and all of you have shown extraordinary resiliency in the face of this ever-changing crisis. Um, so thank you. Not a lot of questions or anything like that, because tomorrow we'll get into it. But just want to say thank you. And uh, we are always here to partner, as we have been throughout the years, but particularly uh, since this pandemic came to, to affect us. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Navarro. We have three more council members yet to speak in a public hearing that starts in just a couple of minutes. Uh, I remind all of my colleagues, we will have an extended discussion. I remind the public as well. I know there are many operational questions that have been posed uh, that we will be discussing tomorrow. The metrics that are being used uh, allow HHS some time to digest and process the requests that were made and hopefully give them time to be able to react as early as tomorrow with some preliminary thoughts on how we move forward. Um, but I now turn it over to Council Member Friedson, then followed by Council Vice President Glass, and uh, then Council Member Katz in the end. Council Member Friedson. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate you joining us uh, today and, and for the discussion. And I did want to note, uh, as has been noted, that we are in an unprecedented situation. And I think we all recognize that there are impossible choices that have to be made uh, on a daily basis. And, you know, certainly the school system uh, has uh, faced those, like individual families have had to make impossible uh, choices. The school system, uh, those choices are magnified uh, by, you know, 160,000 uh, or more if you include staff. So uh, certainly I recognize that, but I, I do think that it's why communication is so key to build and 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 keep trust uh, in the community, uh, in the staff, and, and I do think we need to do better uh, when it comes to communication. I think as a school system, I think as county government, I, I think all of us ha have not communicated what we're doing, why we're doing it, what we're changing, and why we're changing it nearly as well as we need to. And so I just you know, wanted to, to note that this is a start uh, to that or, or a part of that, I should say, since it's not the beginning. Uh, but but I do think as we look towards moving forward of how do we do better, uh, you know, I, I think it's not the decisions that are made necessarily, uh, why they're being made and when they're being made or changes that have had to happen. Uh, more often than not, to me, it, it's the communication of those decisions, when they're going to be made, uh, how they're going to be made, and by whom. Uh, they're going to be made. So I just wanted to note that at the outset. I do have a few questions. I uh, appreciate the two requests very much. I think it's tangible. It's specific. Uh, I would be supportive of both of them strongly. Just wanted to know, uh, is the Board of Education involved in those uh, decisions? Uh, has the county executive uh, been uh, notified? And, and, and uh, have those requests gone to the executive branch? Because at my view, those are really operational questions, executive branch type uh, requests and not, you know, funding or legislative, although they might come with, you know, capacity and, and funding requests, uh, you know, from us at, at some point. So just wanted to know, you know, if and when the executive branch uh, has been or will be notified and uh, what, if any, response has, has been received. I, I can respond to that. Um, yes, we have talked to um, County Executive Mark Elrich about contact tracing several times. And, um, you know, it continues to fall on the school system for the most part, but this has been one of the primary concerns of our principals and the administrative staff in all of our buildings. So yes, we have done that. With regard to the number of tests, we think that it's very important that we specifically add our pre-K students to our testing reg regime. And therefore, we've decided that we need to come up with a, a better system for ensuring that no one is transmitting in our schools. And that's what this is about. If we can get more tests, we can do that. 
Great. Well, I appreciate it. It would be helpful, I think, for us as a council to, to know the formal uh, response from the county executive on those uh, requests. It sounds like there is fairly broad support, at least from those who have spoken thus far on these requests. So I assume that'll be fleshed out a little bit more tomorrow. So I'll uh, hold off on going further on that, but just wanted to, to note that. Uh, the, the dashboard uh, that the school system had, which I think is very helpful, I know that there have been changes of how the dashboard is going to be used uh, and, and, and what we're basing this off of. Uh, but I think if we're going to have a dashboard, it is absolutely essential that it be updated on a regular basis. And so there have been concerns raised about that. Just wanted to know if there are any operational improvements or changes uh, for residents uh, to expect. Uh, to make sure that any dashboard that's being provided, both we know what it's being used for and that it's being updated uh, on, an, uh, on a regular basis. Yes, sharing of information, thank you for that question. Sharing of information with our families is really important. And most importantly, knowing that uh, those who are making decisions about or, or making recommendations about what we do as, do, uh, as schools are involved in that. I will ask uh, Mr. DeAndrea to address your specific question around the functionality of the dashboard and um, its use given the fact that we're looking at uh, many different sources of data now as a school system. Mr. DeAndrea. Thank you, Dr. McKnight, and good morning, Councilmember Friedson. The information on our dashboard, we've been continually upgrading over the course of the year. At the beginning of the year, we really wanted to have a way to communicate to families information about active cases and total number of cases for this school year, as well as active numbers of quarantines and total number of quarantines. And so the initial release of the dashboard this fall provided that information for the community on a school-by-school -school basis, as well as for the system as a whole. Later in the fall, and as we moved into December with the increase in number of cases as a result of the Omicron variant, there was a desire to have information about the daily number of cases in each school. And so as a result, starting um, after the new year, beginning of 2022, on each school day, we now release the information on the number of student and staff cases reported on that particular day in each of our, in each of our school sites. We are continuing to look at ways to upgrade this information, and I think the community will continue to see improvements as we move forward um, because we recognize that uh, transparency of information is critical. And so we've been continually taking steps to evaluate what are the best ways to get information as quickly as possible and be able to share it with the community. Um, but those are the two key areas where we currently provide information. Thank you for that. Uh, just Speaking up uh, to the rapid tests that were mentioned earlier that would be available to pre-K, there have been con some concerns of their availability to substitute teachers. I know we talked about pay and other issues related to the availability of subs, but will rapid tests be available to substitutes? Are they currently available to substitutes, or is that part of the need for the request of additional numbers because you don't have enough uh, for the substitutes? Yes, I could clarify that. So actually, our pre-K pre students are receiving the rapid test. Right now, our enrollment falls around 156,000, a little over, of students in K-12. to Pre-K represents a little over 4,000 students. So when we're talking about the generally 160,000, that does include pre-K. The reason we tend to ask requests around the 190,000 is because while we have a little over 25,000 employees, 5,000 of them represent those substitutes and um, and others. And so we we when we think about particularly things around tests and knowing that our substitutes are in our buildings and often and we need them in our buildings, we're including them in that count to be a part of that. That extra 5,000 does include substitutes, temporary part-time um, and part-time employees. Appreciate that. Just last question uh, here uh, for today. Uh, there were new guidelines issued on Friday for local school systems and uh, child care by the department of health, the County Department of Health related to the quarantine uh, guidelines uh, for uh, exposures, et cetera. They were updated over the weekend. I just wanted to know there have been some confusion among uh, the public and in the press of whether or not MCPS would be following those or whether MCPS would be issuing new guidance based off of, uh, or new uh, uh, um, standards based off of those guidelines. I just wanted to see if we could get clarity on that. Thank you. I did see a familiar face, Dr. Bridges, who <laughs> just appeared on the screen. So, um, of course, as you mentioned, this was very recent information that has uh, come over the weekend. Um, I'm sure that's planned for our pending conversation that we have coming up in terms of translation of the school system. Dr. Bridges, I did see you appear. I didn't know if you wanted to comment, sir. Sure, Dr. McKnight, thank you, and good morning, uh, uh, council members sitting as a board of health. Yes, we will continue to work with our MCPS partners uh, to review and discuss the uh, 
uh, guidelines as recently uh, indicated uh, by CDC or revised by CDC as well as uh, the Maryland State Department of Education and the Maryland Department of Health. I was just advised this morning that they too updated some additional uh, recommendations and or guidance, and we will continue to have those discussions. Council Member Fritz and I have some additional information regarding child care providers because I know that there were some additional questions of his application and how it would apply to those settings for uh, children who are uh, five and younger. And so I will... Uh, uh, address those uh, during our update. But the answer is yes, we will continue to have those conversations and look at those better practices to keep our uh, our students safe. Appreciate it, and, and thank you. And I do just think that there's a tremendous amount of confusion of who's responsible for what. What is the County Department of Health? What is the State Department of Health? You know, what is the school system? What is the County Council? What is the executive? And I do think we all need to do a better job of figuring out how we better communicate you know, who's making what decisions, when and how uh, to the public, uh, I think it would it, it would really provide a greater sense of understanding and a little less stress for families who are already experiencing too much. So thank you very much. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council, Pre uh, Council Member Fritz. And I want to uh, apologize to the people who are waiting for the public hearing that was slated to start about 10 minutes ago. We are almost done, I promise. Uh, we have two more colleagues that are gonna speak uh, briefly regarding MCPS issues, and then we will begin the public hearing. Council Vice President Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, President Wolf and Dr. McKnight, uh, thank you and your colleagues for, for joining us this morning. This has not been an easy period for you, for MCPS, for our teachers, our parents, and most of all, our students. We have to remember what this is all about, and it is to ensure that every child receives the best education possible. And we know that the best education is achieved inside a classroom, which is why we are doing everything that we can to keep our school community safe. And we have to keep everybody safe so that we can continue educating our kids. And we can and must do both. They are not mutually exclusive. They're tough. And that's what this conversation is about. But we have to do both. Um, Dr. McKnight, I, I personally, want to extend my support for your request to provide MCPS with the rapid tests that you need to ensure that our children have what they need to keep them in the classrooms, to keep them safe, to keep teachers safe, to keep their families safe. And I think that that should be among the highest priority uses for the rapid tests that we have. Um, we also need greater flexibility from Governor Hogan, as has been noted, especially in our ability to have opt-out testing at school. Um, and while I know that there'll be a more substantive conversation tomorrow at the ENC committee, um, Dr. McKnight, I do have uh, one general question for you as we continue having this public conversation and trying to figure out wh where our policies and guideposts are through various social media channels and news outlets. There have been a lot of conversations about a hybrid model for learning, for those who want to be in the classroom and for those who are concerned about their health or the health of a family member and decide that they want to be home. And so I'm curious if we at MCPS have the capability to have a hybrid model for those who who want it. Thank you, Councilman Vice President Glass. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, the immediate need was to be able to, to provide flexibility to families who are in that situation right now. And so since we've had the experience of over a year being able to provide hybrid virtual options of learning to learning to students, then we know exactly what we can provide and what can we what we can provide of quality to students at different grade levels. We can't, we can't compare apples to oranges. Our elementary students need what they need, now secondary students need what they need, and it's not always the exact same. So uh, the plan that we presented to the Board of Education on Thursday provided that option of, for those families who are uncomfortable right now in coming to school, they can use that virtual format. In terms of hybrid, that's exactly what we did in the spring. So we had a lot of time to learn from March, last March until uh, June. That's what we did. We ran a hybrid system. And this year, we actually came forward sharing as a part of our contingency plan exactly what that hybrid system would be. It may be beneficial for us to get into the details of that just to remind 
um, our community of exactly the components of that hybrid program, because who knows, I mean, if something happens and we have to move to that option, we want our community to be, to be informed and to know exactly what to expect. And so having that conversation in August when we were, when we were sharing our contingency plan, if we had to go to hybrid, I think resonates different with families now, given the fact that we've gone through another variant. And so coming back and reminding them of exactly what that model is would be beneficial. So I, I think it would be great for us to touch on that, um, just to have that conversation tomorrow. And the answer is simply yes. Uh, well, thank you for that. And as we continue moving forward and doing what's in the best interest of our students, uh, it is really instructive, as you noted, to look it behind us and see what worked and what didn't work. Um, and there's a lot that didn't work because we had never experienced a situation like the one we had. And as long as we stay focused on our main priority, and that is making sure that every child receives the best education possible, we will provide you. I'm committed to providing you all with what you need. Um, I'm hearing similar comments from my colleagues um, because, again, we just have to keep focusing this on what matters, and it's making sure all of our children learn. And so thank you for this conversation, uh, and we'll, we'll be engaged uh, much deeper level tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Katz and then Councilmember Hucker has one last point that he wants to make. Colleagues, we are way over. Uh, we've got people in the waiting room. Um, uh, so please, Councilmember Katz. Thank you, Mr. President. I will be as brief as I possibly can. So much has already been said, and it's no need for me to repeat it. The bo that bottom line is the keys to this are communication, flexibility on what we're doing, and to keep our partners who are, are who are our parents, our, our uh, principals and our teachers, and of course their students in the communication loop. Um, I, I certainly am supportive of, um, of the uh, two requests. However, I do believe that in order to be, in order to be uh, effective, we need to make certain that HHS A has the personnel to do the con uh, contact tracing and that we have the rapid test. And for us to say, oh, yes, they should do it, or are they saying, oh, yes, we can do it, then what are we giving up by them doing it? And how fast can they do it? All of this needs to be done in, in, in conjunction with each other. I keep saying this is a puzzle that has got to fit together. And part of the problem is the puzzle at this point has not fit together as good as it should. We all have the same desire that this is going to be something that we can figure out what to do. But at this point, we have to make certain that the, that the people who were, if you're, if we're handing over the tracing, they have to be able to do it right then. We can't say that they'll be doing it in a month from then. So with that, Mr. President, I'm going to turn it back. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hatz. Councilmember Harker had one point he wanted to make. It, just a question to follow up on what's been said, uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, since, since uh, I guess Ms. Williams is here. Um, my understanding is if the county is providing the test, we're not constrained by the rule to opt in. Is that true or false? So it, uh, I suppose you're referring to if the uh, we're not operating under the state grant. Um, that is true. However, the medical providers still have the obligation. So if it's something that a particular medical provider um, uh, seeks to waive or so that would be a conversation to have with the testing provider. Okay, so it sounds like we'd have the ability to opt in. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. We'll, we'll elaborate on that and so much more tomorrow. Thank you all very much uh, to our colleagues at MCPS for joining us this morning. Uh, I have some operational questions myself that I'm going to ask tomorrow, um, but uh, in the interest of time and so much else we have to get through this morning. Uh, and thank you, Chairman Rice, for scheduling the expanded education and culture session tomorrow at 10 a.m. I know most, if not all, of my colleagues plan on attending. Uh, so thank you, Dr. McKnight. Uh, we look forward to the continued conversation tomorrow. And thank you very much. President Wolf for joining us as well. All right, colleagues, we're gonna now move on uh, to the next item on the agenda. We are about 17 minutes behind. Again, my apologies to all of the speakers who have been waiting patiently. Uh, we next have a public hearing on the resolution to adopt a Board of Health regulation. 
to present to pre prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the county, vaccination requirements to enter bars, restaurants, recreation centers, and other covered establishments. Um, Ms. Salou, I know there are public speakers for this hearing. I now turn it over to you to manage the next part of the public hearing process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Our first speaker this morning is Ms. Bethany Mandel. Ms. Mandel, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. So everyone here is going to tell you why this is bad for businesses and for residents. I'm here to tell you why this is bad for you as politicians. This is gonna be the end of your cushy government bureaucratic careers. Here's the thing. The seats for this council are up for a primary vote in June. That's the deciding election in this county. An election the only truly, truly motivated people bother to vote in during off election years. Unfortunately for you, you've made us care and we've filled these speaking slots within three minutes of them opening. For those of you who are facing term limits, we're coming for your seats. For those of you who plan to run again, we're coming for yours. This resolution is the final straw for a number of businesses, groups, and individuals in this county who have seen you come close to destroying everything they've built. They're willing to put money behind getting a council who won't try to bankrupt them and by extension the county. If you're a business or individual looking to make change, contact me. And if you're interested in running for one of these seats, contact me too. We started contacting lawyers about a legal challenge to this poorly thought out law if you pass it. The SCOTUS just knocked down the OSHA mandate. Do you want the black guy involved in national tension on this amateur attempt at lawmaking? They'll ask you, who's responsible for determining exemptions? Why require a five-year-old to be vaccinated for an indoor playground, but not require them in senior centers? It's a joke, but so are you. What's the objective here? The vaccine doesn't stop transmission. The county is already one of the most vaccinated in the country. The burden is on you to prove that this is necessary, and it's not. Get back to doing what you do best passing meaningless statements of support for made up holidays. Go to cut some ribbons outside shopping malls. Go talk to a disgruntled resident about sidewalks or bike lanes. Or better yet, deal with the astronomical increase in crime in this county instead of putting police resources towards enforcing a vaccine mandate before we have a, maxi a vaccine mandate version of Eric Garner. This kind of mandate is wholly inappropriate and not within your job descriptions, even if you call yourself the Board of Health. You're unskilled bureaucrats and nothing more. Stay in your lane. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Vendel. Our next speaker is Ms. Kathy Marzen. Ms. Marzen, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Good morning. I'm a longtime resident, a mother, and an MCPS teacher, and I oppose the vaccine passport. The residents of Montgomery County have done everything you've asked in terms of preventative measures and vaccination for the past two years, and yet we still have experienced this latest wave. Despite our best efforts, our metrics are not better when compared to nearby counties that have been less restricted. In fact, our case numbers are worse. You told us restrictions would lift when we reached 80% vaccinated. We are 90% for the CDC, yet you're moving the goalposts again, proposing to increase restrictions. I'm vaccinated, and I don't want to show proof to participate in everyday life. It won't make us safer as anyone can transmit COVID. Dr. Fauci said we will all likely get it. Pfizer's CEO has stated that the vaccine is not highly effective against the new variant, making increased vaccination less useful than it was a few months ago. A passport won't persuade unvaccinated adults. If they haven't done it by now, they're not going to do it. All your proposal does is potentially harm unvaccinated children by keeping them from activities that help their physical, social, and emotional health. Our children are suffering. They haven't had a normal school year in three years. This is not how childhood is supposed to be. Your proposal includes dance studios, pools, gyms, and threatens to take away opportunities for physical activity and socialization. You have no idea how happy kids were to finally be able to participate in these things again. And businesses have worked hard to provide these services in a safe way. You may think all parents should be eager to vaccinate their children against COVID, but it's only authorized for kids under emergency use, and it does not have full FDA approval. This authorization has only been out for two months. It can be difficult to see the benefit of vaccination for children when the risk of illness is so low. They have a long life ahead of them, and there are many unknowns. This doesn't make their parents anti-vax, and they shouldn't be forced to choose between their kids' overall well-being and this vaccine. Your proposal includes important developmental activities during kids' formative years. We should be looking at the big picture regarding their physical, emotional, and developmental needs. Please do not put parents in this lose-lose position and do not inflict further harm on children by keeping them from participating in activities that they love. 
vote no to the passports. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Marzette. Our next speaker is Ms. Elizabeth Forassi. Ms. Forassi, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Good morning, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Forassi and I live in Chevy Chase. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Before I begin, I wanna share a little background. I'm a stay at home mom. I'm fully vaccinated as are my husband and my kids. I'm an educated woman with a professional career background in the service and hospitality industry, particularly hotels and restaurants. And my family experienced firsthand over the holiday season what it is to have and to live with COVID. I'm a lifelong Democrat. I believe in vaccines, but not mandates. I believe we elect representatives who work for the people, not dictate how we should live. I strongly oppose the council's mandate to proof, to proof, proof of vaccines, including carrying vaccine passports for us residents to do normal everyday activities, such as eat at restaurants, exercise at the gym or enjoy a concert. I propose these, the council's proposal for three reasons. First, the council is ignoring the impact of the mental health on our children. I do not wanna live in a world where my children are nervous or scared to enter a restaurant because they may not have the correct paperwork. I see every day as a mom and an active community volunteer, how COVID and our response to it has harmed our children. And I do get a little emotional about it. Kids today are already on edge and traumatized by the mass mandates in school. We should not seek to add any more stress on our future stars just because they or their parents happen to forget their vaccine card on the counter. Kids today are already confused and don't understand why masks are required in Maryland and their friends and family of Virginia don't need to wear one. We must do better for our children. Second, the proposal unfairly converts local businesses and service workers into enforcers, compelling restaurants and gyms and and the placing responsibility on them is the wrong people. Asking, for example, an 18-year-old hostess making minimum wage to look at a picture on a patron's phone or a server whose English might not be their first language and may be intimidated by official paperwork, it's just not right or fair to put these hardworking people who have already suffered during COVID in that position. And finally, the proposal ignores our privacy and protected health information. Federal law protects vaccination information and recognizes it to be among the most private and sensitive health information an individual has. Community members should not be compelled Rossi, to share the most sensitive Rossi, health information. Yes. I'm sorry, your time is up, ma'am. I totally understand, but you guys are also running a little late. I'm sorry, there are other speakers online have to move on. Your, the council will consider your full written testimony. Thank you for your testimony, ma'am. Our next speaker is Mr. Jason Neuringer. Mr. Neuringer, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you very much. Uh, before I begin, I would ask that the County Council pay attention to the speakers. I noticed Will Jawando, Craig Rice, and Sydney Katz were not focusing on the past three speakers. Instead, we're looking down at their phones. Now, it is clear that no one in this council gets out much. It's clear that no one in this council knows or even cares about the people of Montgomery County. Because if you did, you would know the people are hurting. You walk into a giant, you see empty shelves. You walk into a restaurant, you see regular items missing from menus. You walk into a McDonald's and you pay six fifty for a Happy Meal that costs four fifty in neighboring Fairfax County. And now you want to put salt on the wound of a problem that you caused. You want to force a vaccine passport on people, a passport where there is not a single shred of evidence that this will stop a single infection, not one. It will not stop one death. It will not stop one hospitalization. You reference New York, Philadelphia, Chicago in your cases to enact this passport, but all these locales have experienced an explosion of cases despite strict protocols. And how long is this gonna last? Two weeks, two years, two decades? Before you tell us this is temporary, we've been temporarily wearing masks for two years, so spare us. Now it's clear you made up your minds and you're clearly not listening to us. So instead, Instead of listening to your irrational and incompetent, instead of listening to this irrationality and incompetence, I'm taking my case to the Montgomery County people. And I ask anyone listening to, to anyone listening who sees the rationale in this to vote out any councilman who votes for this. How much longer do we have to suffer under this incompetent council? And by the way, you gave a public forum for this and only listened 20 people? Try listening to 20,000 people. I think you'll be unpleasantly surprised. This is just more proof that this council doesn't care and is too arrogant to listen to the people. 
vote for this and get voted out. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Ms. Katia Basil. Ms. Basil, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you're ready. We can't hear you, ma'am. Unmute. Thank you, council members, for allowing me to share my testimony today. This weekend, my fully vaccinated husband and myself made the difficult decision to leave Montgomery County three years after moving here. We do this with a heavy heart. For a time, we loved living here. We loved the parks, the restaurant, and the people. Montgomery County is a diverse, accepting community where people love their neighbors, regardless of their political affiliation, ethnic background, or personal medical decisions, and that's a beautiful thing. Vaccine passport is nothing more than a euphemism for institutionalized segregation, and segregation brings out the ugliest side of humanity. The people of Montgomery County know this, as evidenced by the fact that 29 out of the 33 written testimonials on the proposed vaccine passport oppose it. They know that in addition to heralding in a new era of segregation, vaccine passports will not stop the spread. As many have pointed out, they failed to slow the spread in every major city where they've been implemented, from New York to Paris. In fact, cases have skyrocketed after passports were implemented, and this is common knowledge. Even Pfizer CEO Albert Borla acknowledges that the current vaccines are ineffective against Omicron. According to our realtor, my husband and I are not alone. People are selling their homes in Montgomery at a rapid rate, and this trend can be observed in many other parts of the country with COVID restrictions as well. The most recent census shows that people moved in droves away from people from places like New York and California towards less restrictive states like Florida and Texas. I'd like to remind the council that it's an election year, and if members would like to keep their seats, they would do well to heed the public's growing discontent. If this policy is implemented, it's very possible that Montgomery County will lose valuable tax dollars and some of its finest citizens. Living in a divided society is deeply harmful to the human spirit. Myself, my husband, and many of my vaccinated and unvaccinated brothers and sisters in Montgomery County were not raised to discriminate against our fellow citizens and will teach our children the same. As a country, we're more divided than ever. Our politicians and media have already divided us in so many ways. Democrats versus Republicans, Blacks versus whites, and now vaccinated versus unvaccinated. When we marginalize certain groups for their beliefs and life choices, we all become less human and forget how to love each other. Segregation in any form is wrong and has never been on the right side of history. Please choose love over hate, unity over division, and do not divide Montgomery County any further. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mr. Len Lieber. Mr. Lieber, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. We can't hear you, sir. Yeah, I right, unmuted. So I'm Len Lieber, I'm with Team Reality. Uh, I don't know where you clowns live, but the truth is the vaccine does not stop people from getting infected and unvaccinated people are not walking around in a constant state of infection. You think that somehow I'm a dog on a leash, that you get to strip away my liberty while you're pursuing your white whale, that will never happen. You're acting like you can somehow stop spread, stop COVID from happening. It's a respiratory disease virus that will not be eliminated. You're acting like somehow you can. You have destroyed this county. You have acted in, as little petty tyrants, and you're not acting on truth. You're choosing lies. You're not choosing science. There's not one bit of evidence that somehow having a vax passport will prevent people from getting infected, will stop spread. Do you think that somebody who is sick is actually going to walk around, go to a restaurant, go to the gym? They're going to stay home just like you. You, If you were sensible, anybody who is sensible is going to stay home. I had COVID. I choose not to get the vaccine because I don't know what the effects will be. You cannot know. It's impossible to know five, ten years from now what will happen. There's too much evidence that's coming forth right now. There are in FIFA, there are five times the number of professional athletes that have had heart attacks that have fallen on the field. And you want to force people to put, inject this into their system. You want young, healthy people who are not at risk. It's a known fact that it's less than a thousand, ten thousandths of a percent that are affected by this in a detrimental way. Who are you little petty tyrants? You sh if you had integrity, if you had any respect for truth, you would resign from your positions, but you're going to continue in, in your lie because you reject truth. I, I don't know what it does matter with you people, why you think you have a right to do this. 
You're not gonna stop anything from happening. Healthy people are going to go around and continue to be healthy and not spread it. Unhealthy people will stay home. We've already seen Elrich has already triple shot, got infected. Did he stay home exactly at the moment that he- Mr. Lieber, Mr. Lieber, I'm sorry, your time is up, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Ms. Nicole Eckenrode. Ms. Eckenrode, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Good morning. My name is Nicole Eckenrode and my husband and I have owned Team Eckenrode Gym and Fitness in Kensington for nine years. I'm here today to talk about the vaccine passport from a small business perspective. We have safely run our gym since June of 2020 with zero transmissions from member to member, employee to member, or vice versa even before the vaccines were available. My membership is down 50% from pre-pandemic levels. We have already struggled through masking mandates, especially in a gym environment. And my employees are concerned about being the enforcement arm of the health department. In particular, young employees shouldn't shoulder the burden of correctly identifying proper pa vaccine passports or get stuck with dealing with the unruly clients. It is amazing to me as I read the proposed Board of Health's mandate that once again, big box stores, government facilities, and private meeting spaces in residential or office spaces are all exempt. Does COVID stop at their doors? Or is the county picking the winners and losers in their quest for protecting public health? It is us, the small businesses, that have tried to bend with the tide. We have taken on the debt to try and make life better for everyone. And now the thank you we get is further government overreach. If the vaccine passport requirements benefited local businesses, Local businesses would have figured that out a long time ago and enforced them with their own policies. That is because small businesses un survive by understanding what our employees and customers really want from us. And I understand that my vaccinated clients feel safe and satisfied without enforced passports, as do my unvaccinated clients. If you pass, if you pass a vaccine passport in Montgomery County, you will kill my family business and many others like it. On a personal note, I'm a mother to nine children, eight of whom are under the age of 18. It is abhorrent to me that not only will I have to identify my children to complete stranger, but I have to do that in the context of their private health information. No to vaccine passports. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mr. Rick Cottle. Mr. Cottle, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Thank you. I'm also a registered Democrat and will be shocked if after listening to all this testimony that you allow this to go through. My opposition, in my opposition, I provide the following four points. Number one, those of us opposed to vaccine mandates to include people of all identities are frightened. These mandates create an atmosphere of polarization and demonization, which are negative and destructive to a community. I see examples of this in Australia, Canada, parts of Europe, New York, among other places, and I think to myself, thank God I don't live there, or do I? In New York City alone, approximately 3.57 million people have fled just last year for an estimated 34 billion in lost income, according to Reuters. Number two, when Mr. Elrich gives his weekly updates, I can't tell you how many times he's made the statement or has insinuated that the unvaxxed are continuing to allow this virus to spread. To my knowledge, there are no reputable and respectable scientists, virologists, or epidemiologists making a claim that full vaccination will eradicate this virus. There are also no established studies that I know of that prove being vaccinated actually slows the spread. Given the current outbreaks in areas of the most, of the most vaccination, I'd say that the vaccinations have no bearing on spread. So any government official or journalist saying that this claim is essentially, that's making this claim is essentially providing misinformation. But yet we are continually having vaccines pushed down our throats. Number three, when analyzing the data about obtained from usafacts.org, a nonpartisan, unbiased organization that shows over time that there's essentially no significant difference in case rates or mortality rates between states with the least and the most code restrictions or between states with the highest versus the lowest vaccinations. Sure, there are spikes here and there, but overall, our long-term analysis yields no real difference. Research throughout the world also shows the same results. Number four, we as American citizens have an absolute natural right to make our own decisions regarding our health. To restrict or treat differently the unvaxxed, which includes people of all colors or genders, without any confirmed academic consensus that they are an actual threat to society, is reprehensible. 
to even suggest implementing proof of vaccination mandates is a blatant overreaction, overreach, and discrimination by this council. Please do not do this. In closing, you don't have to proceed with this. At least take the time to look at the effects that similar measures are having throughout the world and in other parts of this country. Please look objectively at the data. Ask yourselves, has any government mandate actually done anything to curb this virus? My, my, my son went out with his friends this weekend. It's not Mr. Cotto. And he couldn't go to a restaurant right? with his vaccinated friends, so they didn't. Um, I'll just, no, before we go on, Ms. Lou, I just want to note for the public, I just want to acknowledge an important distinction. The council has not proposed this, this mandate. The county executive has, and we are deliberating and discussing it. Um, I just, several speakers have alluded to the council's proposal, and it's not the council's proposal. I just want to make that distinction and clear. Uh, Ms. Lou, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Councilor. Our next speaker is Mr. Rob Van Alstein. Mr. Alstein, you have two minutes for your testimony, and you may begin when you are ready. Thanks for the time today. It's time for the county's reign of terror over COVID-related mandates to end. Every day, parents like myself live in terror that our children won't be allowed to go to school or even have a bus driver pick them up nearly two years into the pandemic. We live in terror over the county's constant changing policies that require toddlers to mask all day, while council members raise money mask-free in, in the evening. How is this acceptable in the most vaccinated county in the country? The reason for this constant state of terror? It's this council's anti-science policies and our terrible county executive who perpetuate the myth that COVID's going away. We've had vaccines available for over a year, and currently have antivirals available for those who get sick. If you don't know now what steps to take to minimize your risk of COVID, it's never gonna happen. A vaccine passport will do nothing to make our community safer. It's failed to stop Omicron in Europe, Israel, and New York City. Yet this council wants to bring this failed policy to, to Montgomery County. Who's making this recommendation since the county still hasn't hired permanent health officers since Dr. Gales left in September? I'll admit, when I spoke to the council over its failed mask mandate policy in August, I had floated the vaccine passport idea. Since then, the data has, has changed with the arrival of Omicron, which has made vaccine passports completely useless. Unlike this council, which continues the myth that mask mandates work despite record case counts, I can actually admit when I was wrong. What will vaccine passports actually do? First, according to the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce, which opposes them, it'll destroy small businesses. Second, when I was doing community service yesterday in honor of Dr. King, it dawned on me how this passport would disproportionately target minority communities, especially minority children in the county. Would Dr. King support a measure that would shut out 60% of minority children in this county from restaurants and other indoor establishments based on unproven science? I have voted for donating to and worked on Democratic campaigns since I turned 18. Due to the Democratic Party's insistence on masking my toddler and boosted adults like myself indefinitely, while threatening to close schools and proposing discriminatory vaccine passports that don't work, I'll only be voting once this year, this year and that will be on June 28th. On November 9th, when the Democratic leadership wonders how they lost both the House and Senate while the government's races, it'll be due, due to us. Thank you. The time is up, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Stephen Bress. Mr. Bress, you have two minutes for your testimony, and you may begin when you are ready. You need to unmute, sir. We can't hear you. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you, council members, for allowing me to speak. My name is Steve Bress, and I've been a resident of Montgomery County for almost 60 years, and a registered Democrat for more than 40. In the past, I voted for some of you. Well, now it's time to talk about tomorrow. Montgomery County's vision statement talks about the county as being an affordable and welcoming community, as well as having a growing economy. The county prides itself on being inclusive and welcoming. A more equitable and inclusive Montgomery County starts out the statement. If implemented, vaccine passports would be the opposite of this. They would be divisive and exclusionary and encourage people to shop and spend time outside of the county in order to meet the needs and goals of their families. Uh, you might think that the risks of COVID outweigh the county's vision statements. Well, 
if the stated values are so weak that they may be changed for even received short-term gain, they are not values. They are simply statements for pandering to the constituents. If these are actually core values, now is the time to use them and find ways to protect our community that align with these noble values. Um, so there has been some talk about health authorities. I would like to offer yeah, a few quotes. Dr. Fauci, in November of 2020, before the rollout of the vaccines, these vaccines won't prevent infection, but will prevent severe illness and death. Dr. Fauci, again, testifying to Congress January 11, 2022, Omicron, with its extraordinary, unprecedented degree of efficiency of transmissibility, will ultimately find just about everyone. More importantly, a recent CNN interview with Dr. Ra Rachelle Walensky, the interviewer asks, especially if there's a breakthrough case, you, could, you get COVID, you're fully vaccinated, but you're totally asymptomatic. You, you could still pass on the virus to someone else. Is that right? Dr. Walensky answers, that's exactly right. These and studies that back up these statements show that all residents are equal in their ability to catch and transmit the virus. As such, there's no valid reason to implement a vaccine passport. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mr. Matt Lieber. Mr. Lieber, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you're ready. Uh, Councilmember Albano, the rest of the council, thank you for your time. Obviously, I'm not a new face for you guys um, and I'm not gonna rehash things that are already said. Just wanna attack this as a comment about a flawed policy um you know it's already been brought up this same policy has been implemented in many other cities uh with the intent of driving vaccination rates if you look at their data it never did drive those vaccination rates um we're also way more vaccinated than any of those jurisdictions that are already so i'm not really sure what the goal of this policy is uh, we're already way more vaccinated than most places so it's not going to drive more vaccination. Somebody already said this, that last 5% that's not vaccinated, this isn't going to change their mind. Um, I also want to attack this from a logistics standpoint. It's a flawed implementation policy for several reasons. One, as already stated, you're putting this onus on small businesses that have already taken this pandemic on the chin. I would have to hire additional staff to implement this passport check. And I can't give jobs away right now. Like I've had jobs listed for six months and we can't fill them. So I'm not sure who we're supposed to do to put in front of the door to make sure we can check these. And then majority of our business is under the age of 18, many of which don't have identification. So how am I supposed to even verify these passports? I, they can give me a vaccine card. They'll have anyone's name on it. I have no means to actually verify that's the person. So just from an implementation standpoint, this is a flawed policy. So I ask you to not implement this. Um, we've, we've shown it, it is not effective in what the goal was for this. And to Councilman Abernos, to your point, um, I do understand that this isn't your your policy and you're being asked to deal with it, but I think that's a great correlation to what this policy would do to a business. It's not our policy, but we're being asked to implement it, and we're going to get the same reaction that you're getting today. And unfortunately, it's going to be an 18-year-old kid that's trying to deal with a grown adult that's screaming at them. It's just not a good idea. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Ms. Lori McCarthy. Ms. McCarthy, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Lori McCarthy, and I'm a longtime resident of Montgomery County. Uh, I would encourage the Montgomery County Council to reject the vaccine passport mandate for several reasons. Some people are understandably concerned about the rushed process to approve this emergency vaccine. While it is reasonable to require FDA-approved vaccines that have gone through the appropriate testing process, this is not one of them. Requiring vaccination passports is a frightening infringement on individual rights. Show me your papers bring scary images of totalitarian regimes whose aim is to coerce citizens into their way of thinking and is not what we need for Montgomery County. Introducing this legislation while businesses are just starting to recover from mandated shutdowns is unthinkable. As the owner of Quincy's Pub put it, we are battling enough as it is with staffing. The last thing we need is our government making more restrictions, making it even harder. We've done everything they've asked, and now they just keep putting more layers. In this county, 95% of citizens have received at least one dose, and 84% are fully vaccinated. Our county executive has argued that if we don't implement the passport mandate in D.C. does, their unvaccinated residents will come to Montgomery County for entertainment. But the D.C. vaccination rate is currently 91 percent with one dose and almost 70 percent fully vaccinated. With such high compliance in both jurisdictions, why do we need such draconian methods? If this legislation goes into effect, when does it end? The bill does not appear to have any provision for termination. Will businesses forever have to comply with this burdensome rule? 
Finally, the surge of the Omicron variant is running rampant through fully vaccinated citizens in Montgomery County, myself included. It seems that the vaccinations do not, in fact, prevent community spread of the current variant, so the timing of implementing this mandate seems absurd. Please vote no to this unnecessary and oppressive mandate. Let individual businesses set up their own policies with regard to vaccination requirements, and your citizens make their own health decisions. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mr. Eric Heckman. Mr. Heckman, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Thank you. This is not a simple matter. One size does not fit all. The Elridge proposal is rife with holes, doomed for failure, unless restaurants and effective businesses buy into a program that is equitable, achievable, and does not place financial and staffing burden on already taxed industries. What has been established for training vaccine passport checkers, similar to ID inspection training for alcohol service conducted by the APS? Fake vaccine cards are readily available for a few dollars. Exempting to-go customers and delivery drivers makes no sense. Many restaurants have 30 or more third-party drivers entering the facility daily, interacting with staff and guests. They use bathrooms. Starbucks, that may have several hundred customers a day, is a COVID spread waiting to happen. Where is the science? Has the council found grant money from state COVID funds to support staff, equipment, and payroll, the vaccine passport process will add to already stressed business. Even at minimum wage, the vaccine checker will cost $5,000 a month plus employee share of taxes. I urge council members, and especially council executive candidates, Reamer, Hucker, Elrich, and Blair, to stand outside Caddy's, my restaurant, in 30 degree weather for six hours verifying the vaccine cards. We will provide standard security guard wage and a meal. Are you suggesting like the silly DC plan that diners be checked after being seated and have the chance to infect staff and other diners? The council must design a well thought out process. Otherwise, this is a political grandstand in an election year without accomplishing any positives. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Ms. Marcella Feza. Ms. Feza, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Good morning. Just last week, Dr. Fauci said, Omicron will ultimately find just about everybody. Whether or not you are vaccinated, you will be infected by Omicron. We are not in a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Unvaccinated people are not the threat. The virus is the threat. With no sunset clause, this resolution creates a perpetual underclass of people, legalizes discrimination against them, and promotes the stigmatizing and othering of them. The stated purpose of this resolution is to curb the spread of COVID in a less deleterious manner than previous measures. Arguably, this resolution's severe restriction of individual freedom is more injurious than previous measures invoked by the council. Vaccine mandates don't work. New York City's heavy-handed restrictions yielded no benefit in transmission rates. Since implementation of its mandate in August 2021, New York City's daily case rates have mirrored those of Montgomery County, and yet we did not have a mandate. 85% of Montgomery County residents are fully vaccinated, and 95% have had at least one dose. So what's the end game here? 100% vaccination would not mitigate the contagion and will never result in zero COVID. There is a personal benefit of vaccination because it reduces severity for the individual. But the public health benefit is minimal as it does not reduce chances of catching or transmitting the disease. Whether or not to get the vaccine should be a personal decision made with one's doctor, not by politicians who can't possibly know what is best for each individual. I am fully vaccinated and yet I contracted COVID in December. I am not opposed to vaccines. I am opposed to limiting people's freedom to live their daily lives by imposing a coercive mandate. I ask council members to remember that the virus is the threat. The unvaccinated are not. I ask you not to mandate a vaccine passport in Montgomery County. Vote no on this resolution. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mr. Chris Spearden. Mr. Spearden, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. 
Hi, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I'm not going to repeat everything. Um, everybody said my points previously, the CDC director's comments, uh, the Pfizer CEO comments about uh, offering limited protection against Omicron, um, the recent reports based uh, from Israel about number four shot not providing protection. Um, and I'd like to focus the council to the questions and answers that the executive um, provided them answers nine and 10 in light of this recent reports are, are need to be amended because they said that any number of doses is effective, uh, particularly against Omicron. So th um, that's in a disagreement with recent data as it unfolds. Um, again, I'd sincerely ask everyone to uh, consider the previous testimony um, with a vaccine that no longer stops transmission or provide adequate protection against the currently circulating variant. This regulation is uh, ill-conceived, inappropriate, illogical, and, and should be rejected. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Our next speaker is Mr. Casey DeRobertus. Mr. DeRobertus, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Uh, this is Casey Deerberg, that is. Um, I'm a Montgomery County resident and I oppose a vaccination requirement to enter public establishments in the county. This past weekend, DC began enforcing proof of vaccination for all patrons entering indoor businesses. According to DC's vaccination data as of Sunday, 50.6% of the black population had not been vaccinated, the largest group by race compared to 42.5% of the white population and 30.5% of the Asian Pacific Islander population. This seems so wrong that on a weekend of remembrance for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., half of the black population was denied entrance into DC public businesses. Um, someone's personal medical history or their sincerely held religious belief might be why they're not getting vaccinated. Perhaps someone has natural immunity, which has been proven to be more effective than a vaccine. Um, the reasoning shouldn't matter and it should be respected. We have inalienable rights that allow us to freely make choices and not be coerced into something in order to participate in society. Montgomery County prides itself on its diverse population and inclusion of people from all backgrounds. The vision statement of the Office of the County Executive is as quoted, a more equitable and inclusive Montgomery County. A vaccine requirement would not align with this vision of inclusion whatsoever. The Montgomery County Recreation website states as its mission to provide high quality, diverse and accessible programs that enhance the quality of life for all and will readily serve the community by providing safe havens where people feel welcomed. By pre preventing unvaccinated people from entering indoor rec facilities, how is that being inclusive to the whole community where everyone feels welcomed? Given that the CDC director has stated that the vaccine does not prevent transmission, it's hard to grasp why there's such a push to require a COVID-19 vaccine in public places. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Please reconsider the vaccine requirement. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Ms. Sonva Hamidi. Ms. Hamidi, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Hi, um, we are Sunny and Lauren, the owners of a personal training studio in Gaithersburg. We're here to speak against the vaccine passport requirement, specifically for gyms and fitness centers. In a county that's 85% vaccinated, the lack of vaccination is not the largest threat to COVID in our community. The lack of good health is. Obesity, obesity, diabetes, and heart disease are the top three comorbidities for severe COVID. According to the CDC, exercise is the number one way to combat every one of these diseases. According to your own program, Healthy Montgomery, in 2018, 61.3% of our county was obese, and in there were over 400,000 deaths due to, heart, due to heart disease alone. We can safely assume the pandemic has increased these numbers, perhaps significantly. In comparison, there's been a total of 1,828 deaths due to COVID in the county since the pandemic began. This sheds light to where health initiatives and medical attention should really be driven. Obesity, heart disease, and diabetes are all listed as core measures under the Healthy Montgomery Initiative. It's quoted by Mark Elrich, the county government is committed to providing exceptional service to our many diverse communities, residents, and businesses. Mandating a vaccine passport for gyms will do the opposite. It'll limit access to the best resource possible. 
COVID has opened the door to a huge opportunity to push the Healthy Montgomery Initiative. We need to take it. We ask that you please reconsider this mandate in particular for gyms. We ask that instead of restricting access to 15% of the community, you educate the community on the importance of health and regular exercise. Encourage utilizing gym facilities as a way to avoid severe COVID. This is exactly what the Healthy Montgomery Initiative appears to set out to do. Be the leaders, not only in the fight against COVID, but also in leading to your Montgomery County overall. We ask that you recognize that gyms and fitness centers are part of the solution, and not the problem. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Ms. Elizabeth Camporo. Mr. Com Mrs. Camporo, you have two minutes for your testimony, and you may begin when you are ready. Good morning, council members. Thank you for having this hearing today. I've been a citizen of Montgomery County for 35 years now, and I have a vested interest, as do you, in the county's vitality and robust health on all levels. To require passports to participate with many designated covered establishments will have a substantial negative impact on our community. Businesses will leave, residents will move, and some residents who stay in Montgomery County will go to neighboring counties to conduct their business. Whether it's businesses closing, residents moving, or doing business elsewhere, a decided blow to the tax base is inevitable. Furthermore, the possibility of potential new businesses would be eliminated. All of this translates into significant economic decline with no foreseeable growth. We want to keep our county financially healthy. As it stands, most of us in the county, 84.9%, are fully vaccinated, and 95% have had their first dose. Additionally, researchers at Nature Communications and the Journal of American Medical Association have both found that asymptomatic transmissions of coronavirus are less than 1%. JAMA reported that 0.7% of asymptomatic transmissions were among households, which would point to an even lesser percentage of asymptomatic transmissions in the general population. As we know, the Omicron variant is hitting everyone, the unvaccinated and even the vaccinated, and fortunately it's less virulent and moving through quickly. As we've seen, nothing is stopping the spread of the Omicron variant. As our mothers taught us, if you're sick, don't go out. I think their advice is being wisely followed. To summarize, passing this regulation would open the door to further catastrophic economic decline, causing a blow to the tax base. Additionally, this policy isn't going to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And that wraps up our speakers for this public hearing. Mr. Council President. Thank you, Ms. Salou. This public hearing is now closed. Uh, appreciate the comments and a lot of thoughtful feedback there uh, from, from a number of the people that uh, spoke. Uh, we are now going to move on to a work session uh, where we will be hearing from uh, organizations that represent some of the businesses that uh, will be impacted by this and uh, required to uh, institute it if it is approved. Uh, and so, Ms. Wellens, if you could please uh, introduce the folks who will be speaking before us on this panel. I ask each speaker to limit your testimony to between two and four minutes. Uh, and then to my colleagues, after each of the panelists have spoken, um, then we will assume a, Q a question and answer period. Uh, Ms. Wellens, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Council President, Council Vice President, and Council Members. Uh, good morning. And um, our panelists include representatives from the Restaurant Association, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Greater Silver Spring Chamber of Commerce, Greater Bethesda Chamber of Commerce, African American Chamber of Commerce, Commerce, uh, Strathmore, and the Maryland Hotel Lodging Association. Um, so, um, Mr. President, I'll just uh, begin by, you know, announcing uh, person by person so they can give any initial comments they'd like to. And then, as you said, turn over to questions and answers. Um, also, just wanted to note, I'm not sure if it's been noted that that next week, um, the staff packet indicates um, a, a vote tentatively scheduled for next week on this. But in fact, there will be another public hearing due to the high interest of the public in speaking to this matter. Um, your first panelist is um, Mr. Thompson, Restaurant Association of Maryland. Thank you very much. 
um, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I'm Melvin Thompson, representing the Restaurant Association of Maryland. And with the devastating impact of the COVID shutdowns and restrictions on the food service industry during the early days of the pandemic, we hope the county officials continue to avoid reimposing capacity limits and restrictions because many in our industry simply cannot withstand it again. We want to keep our employees working and provide safe environments for our staff and customers. However, we also need to ensure that indoor dining customers are not subjected to overly onerous proof of vaccination requirements and related service delays that could cause some to avoid indoor dining altogether. We've received mixed feedback from our county restaurant members about the proposed requirement, and there are many questions that remain unanswered about the details. If the Board of Health intends to adopt such, adopt such a requirement, we would request that industry feedback and concerns be addressed to make such a requirement more workable for our industry and the customers that we serve. And we also request that any metrics for lifting such a requirement be clearly specified in the regulation. It cannot be in effect indefinitely. And we leave it to the county health officials or the Board of Health to decide which metrics will be used, but it should be specified. And also, given the differences in operations among the various segments of our industry and related staffing needs, businesses should be allowed the flexibility of determining the point at which vaccination proof is verified. Businesses that can have a host at the entrance can verify there. Businesses without such host stations may verify at the table or at the ordering counter, and it could also vary depending upon circumstances and staffing. And on a related note, some of our restaurants have also asked whether the county can provide assistance to businesses to help cover the costs of any additional staff that might be needed to enforce such a requirement. And there's also some concern about the medical and religious exemptions. If proof of COVID test that is negative is required for customers entitled to such an accommodation, that too should be clearly stated in the regulation. However, our businesses should not be required to request documentation from those customers because that could result in unnecessary confrontation. And restaurants with, uh, that serve young fa families with young children have also expressed concerns about proof of vaccination requirements applying to children under age 12. The District of Columbia's requirement doesn't apply to children under age 12, and Baltimore City officials have no plans to include children under age 12 in the requirements that they are currently drafting. And during the introduction of this regulation, there was some council discussion about boosters. Uh, until COVID vaccine boosters are included in the CDC's definition of fully vaccinated, boosters should not be part of the proof of vaccination requirement here. And D.C. does not include it in their requirement, and Baltimore has no plans to do so. And also, because implementing the proof of vaccination regulation requires more planning and training and notice and related guidance, we would request that businesses be given at least two weeks to prepare for it before it takes effect. And also, any related compliance guidance that is subsequently issued by the county regarding such requirement should not establish any additional requirements that were not authorized in the Board of Health regulation. And there's also a requirement in the proposal regarding signage uh, and entry for um, those coming into such businesses. There are exemptions from the vaccine entry requirement, but we believe that those exemptions should also be included on the signage. Otherwise, potential customers who may be coming in only to pick up carry out food may be unaware of the exemptions. And then finally, we appreciate that the proposal does not apply to employees. There is concern in our industry that any requirement that employees also be vaccinated could exacerbate the staffing shortages that we're already experiencing. Uh, DC does not have such a requirement um, in their um, vaccination um, proof um, requirement right now, and Baltimore City has no plans to include such in theirs. And so we appreciate uh, the council sitting at the Board of Health um, considering our concerns and feedback, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Thompson. Mr. President, um, next we have Mr. Vasquez with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. 
Good morning, Council President Oliver Nose and members of the County Council. I am Mauricio Vasquez, Director of Programs of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of Montgomery County. The HCCMC opposes this proposed legislation. The Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of Montgomery County wants to voice our concern regarding this proposed legislation. We have carefully read it and our member business owners met to consider its benefits and drawbacks. At first glance, for many of us vaccine proponents, this legislation sounded like a good idea. But upon looking at the resulting costly social and economic requirements and their relatively low benefit, we must speak out against this proposed legislation. Its negative consequences far outweigh the intended benefits. In short, this legislation will require business owners to only accept patrons with vaccine certifications or official waivers, and it appoints the county police department as enforcers of this proposed requirement. To be clear, the HCCMC fully supports vaccination efforts and the use of masks and social distancing. We support mandates for the use of masks and have as a chamber participated with county efforts to increase acceptance of these safety measures. However, having read the proposed legislation, we strongly believe that insufficient thought has been given to the potential and likely negative financial and social impact of the proposed measures and the negligible positive impact of its enactment. This, les this legislation will further promote social inequities, setting up the opportunity to tell on someone you don't like. Because the enforcement clause sets up the county police as enforcer, it allows a police officer to inspect stores and food establishments for infractions, questioning patrons, and possibly being perceived to target people of color, rightly or wrongly, asking some patrons to leave and finding business owners who may have left an unvaccinated patron in. Unintended targeting of sensitive populations will inevitably ensue whether we intend it or not. The possibility exists and the legislation facilitates it. This, less, this legislation has too many loopholes to ensure only vaccinated people share public space. Vaccination certificates can be borrowed or make fake, whether printed or on your cell phone. It allows acceptance of vaccination waivers, but there is no standard way for someone to show they have a waiver. Also, unless you require ID verification, how can you know that a vaccination certificate belongs to the bearer or is otherwise fake? And if identification is required to verify the vaccination certificate, what of people who do not have one? What about children? They may not be carrying ID or a vaccine card, yet they're the most likely carriers of COVID. Will we ban them next? Some alternatives can have a more positive and long-term effect including better campaigns for vaccination, masking, and testing. Businesses could be encouraged to install air cleaners with HEPA or UVC filters, and many establishments have, and businesses can self-determine whether they wish to require the, their patrons to be vaccinated, advertising at the door or on their web that their affiliation policies are in our vaccination requirement policy as a way to attract customers to their establishment. But this would be their choice, not legislated with punitive enforcement. And is the county setting an example by mandating county staff to be vaccinated when dealing with the public? The county would do well to work with businesses to develop strategies that make sense. The county can encourage safe practices, highlighting safe establishments, rather than enacting legislation that puts the police department and business owners in positions of being viewed as targeting segments of the population as undesirable, rightly or wrongly. And when we have managed the pandemic, what happens to this legislation? It has no sunset provision. Will it become a tool to enable more discrimination? As for the argument of managing understaffed hospital facilities, according to recent reports, vaccine compliance in the county is actually very high and our hospitals report that they're not facing the huge challenges of overwhelm that other areas in the U.S. are reporting. While hospital staff shortages do exist, our hospitals report a plateau in emergency room traffic and admissions, 
with a likely decline over the next few months. Please take this proposal off the table. Let's formulate smarter, longer-term solutions for a safer and thriving community. I thank you for listening, and I'm open for questions, if any. Vasquez, thank you. Ms. Wellens, before you go to the next speaker, I just want a, a housekeeping comment to colleagues in the public. So we do have uh, our health officials here on uh, who will stay on for a Q&A uh, as part of this particular work session. And we will be once again sitting as the Board of Health next week to receive our regularly scheduled update. Uh, but in the interest of time, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, we're going to limit our public health officials comments and scope of the discussion to this particular work session for right now, uh, just to be able to uh, some semblance of staying on time. So with that, I yield back to you, Ms. Wellens, to keep going through the panel. Oh, great. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Vasquez. Uh, the next panelist is Ms. Redeker from the Greater Sil Silver Spring Chamber of Commerce. Good afternoon, council members and colleagues. Um, We've heard a lot this morning, and a lot of it mirrors uh, what we've heard from many of our members. Um, I, I will say that my colleague, Mr. Vasquez, uh, said what a lot of what a lot of what I was going to say. So I'm not. I'm going to try to be a little bit more brief than I would have been, um, so that we have plenty of time for questions. When we first learned of this regulation, proposed regulation, less than two weeks ago, uh, we reached out to our member restaurants, theaters, hotels, gyms, and other businesses that would be subject to the proposal. Um, much of what we heard from them was spoken by the folks who were um, testifying today. Um, some not, not quite so emotionally, but uh, the, the sentiments and a lot of the, the uh, concerns were the same. Um, first of all, they, they were very skeptical that the bill would accomplish the stated goals of increasing vaccination rates and reducing the spread. You've heard the reasons why. Um, our members said the same thing in, uh, in our conversations that you heard from your, from your testi folks who testified this morning. Um, but the biggest problem that they had was in the troubling logistics of implementation if this were to go forward. Um, the first is, is kind of what, what does it actually mean? And someone spoke to this. It requires that a business must not permit a guest, visitor, or customer to enter the indoor premises without displaying proof of ID. That literally means you need a bouncer at the door. And that's just not practical for somebody who already doesn't have a bouncer at the door. You've heard the reasons why in terms of staffing. The bill is also confusing because in the first section, it requires businesses to deny entry to unvaccinated. But yet later in line 99, it, the resolution says that each instance that a covered entity fails to check the individual vaccination status shall constitute a separate violation. So is the violation to set someone, let someone in who's unvaccinated or is the violation not checking the status? So that, that part is extremely confusing to our members. It also prompts a lot more questions than it answered. Um, you've heard about the questions about verifying the validity of the vaccine card uh, against a person's identity, verifying whether the person has a medical um, exemption or a religious exemption that is real. And one example that's good is at what point in a fast casual restaurant where some patrons will be there for carryout, others will eat in, uh, where do we check vaccination status? Do we check them when they walk in the door? That's what the first part of the legislature would, would say. Or does the person who's taking the order check it, which is problematic, or do we check it when they pay? Because we don't know, you don't know when the person's walking in the door, are you eating in or carrying out if you're a fast casual restaurant? Um, one of our movie theaters, and by the way, one of our movie theater members has this in place and has not had any problem with problems with it. But the other one, which is part of a national chain that does not require proof of vaccination, um, raised another challenge. A lot of their patrons buy their tickets on Fandango. Um, Fandango doesn't have a place where they can announce that you have to have your vaccine card when you walk in to see your film. Um, so the patron buys the ticket on Fandango, goes to the theater, learns of the requirement, and is turned away, but wants a refund. But the theater can't make the refund because the ticket wasn't even purchased through the theater. So those implementation problems create some um, untenable issues for, for some people. Both of our theater members asked about the, the validity of exempting individuals for a quick and limited pur purchase or purpose, rather. Um, what about those who enter the theater just to browse before deciding whether a movie or to pick up tickets for a movie that they're going to later or pick up a program or visit the concession stand or visit the bathroom, but they're not going to stay. So at what point and how do they determine you know, how long this person's going to stay and, and how they're going to manage the implementation? Um, the phased-in approach 
also requiring various levels of vaccination at different times for different ages just makes implementation way too complicated um, for, as someone suggested, the 18-year-old uh, hostess at a restaurant or the people who are checking in. If it's going to change, you know, first time it's one shot, then it's two shots, then it's whatever, then it's adding the different age groups. It was just, it, the way it's written is just too complicated. Um, it's also confusing on violations and pen penalties. The provision that states each instance that an entity fails to check an individual's vaccination status shall constitute a separate violation. Does this mean for each individual in a party? If so, what are the penalties? We don't think there should be any if this is really an encouragement educational effort. And how is a complaint verified? Is it just the word of the complainant? And what does the, what does the patron of the restaurant do when a patron gets into a confrontation? Who keeps the peace there? I think you already heard about that from someone. So that said, if you cast aside a lot of the concerns and move ahead with this proposal, uh, which we hope you don't, um, the county has to undertake a public education program similar to what it implemented with the mass, mass mandate. And the county needs to provide businesses the tools and the resources to enforce it. Um, county press release is not enough. We don't have the media that we used to, so people aren't going to know about this. Um, and to many of our members, this regulation is just, it, it creates more trouble and more problems, and they fear that it does little, if any, to achieve the stated goals. Um, and I will also, in, in uh, closing, I'll add that we were very anxious to, to help with communicating all the information through the pandemic about how people can remain safe. We encourage people to get vaccinated. We've, we helped with um, educating consumers and educating and helping our restaurants uh, when the mask mandate came in early on. And so we, we very much support helping the county get to a point of, of positive public health, but our members just don't believe that this is the, the road there. So thank you for your comments and I, for allowing me to make those comments and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Ms. Redeker. The next panelist is Ms. Corin, Greater Bethesda Chamber of Commerce. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Wellens. Um, I'm Ellen Corrin, uh, Chesapeake Public Strategies, but I'm here today on behalf of the Greater Bethesda Chamber as their volunteer vice president of economic development and government affairs. We want to thank Council President Albernos for holding this work session and also want to thank Dr. Stoddard and Jake Weissman for working with us since the resolution was introduced. We would have liked to have been consulted prior to the introduction, but we're more than happy uh, to talk with them now and work with them. I'm going to speak to the overall concerns that our members have expressed to us, then discuss some recommended amendments. Even with these amendments, we remain concerned about the imbalance we see between the cost of this proposal and the limited actual benefits it may produce given our very high vaccination rate. We've coordinated our comments with the Greater Silver Spring Chamber, so we're in agreement with everything that Jane Redeker said today. We understand the desire to keep our community safe, and this is a priority for us as well. Through our Just Mask It campaign, our chamber worked hard to help businesses implement the mask mandate and encourage their patrons and workers to comply. The resolution describes the mandate as a way to avoid closing businesses or imposing capacity limits. That's one of the reasons that was given. To that statement, our members say, please don't help us. You don't understand how our businesses operate. You don't know our unique challenges. We heard businesses testify just now about their challenges with severe labor shortages, and this resolution, of course, exacerbates that problem. Today's packet includes examples of major cities that have instituted a proof of vaccine mandate. These are cities, not communities like Montgomery County. I think that issue was raised at the council last week. So for example, we don't have bars in Montgomery County. So no one is at the door already carting people to see their um, driver's licenses. That can just add one more car check that doesn't happen here. These cities also have much lower vaccination rates than Montgomery County. New York, for example, had a rate only in the 60s when they imposed the mandate, so they had much room for improvement. That's not the case in our county, where 95% of residents have at least one dose of the vaccine and about 85% have the second. There's the practical reality to consider. Our member hotels saw their businesses increase when D.C. passed its passport mandate and people moved their events from D.C. to Montgomery County. They began losing business to Virginia when people learned that our county was considering a similar law. With this resolution, the onus is on establishments to find reasonable accommodations for select unvaccinated people. How does a restaurant do this? Seat them outside in weather like we've had this week? 
block off precious square footage inside just in case they show up? And how do you decide which employees you'll knowingly expose to unvaccinated patrons? Those are just some of the comments we heard from our members. And having said all that, we have several amendments to suggest. Number one, and you've heard this, I think, already, push back the implementation date. We don't believe the county will be able to provide the support and resources that businesses will need in so short a time, and the businesses need time to gear up as well. Second, rather than put the onus on the establishment for screening guests at an event, we suggest making that the responsibility of the group or person that's actually hosting the event. You may recall at the December Committee for Montgomery Breakfast that volunteers screen guests for their vaccine cards, and that worked well. And speaking of hotels, let's make it clear that the resolution doesn't apply to overnight guests. The way the resolution reads now, the hotel will be required to post people at every entrance just to check the status of any person who enters, regardless of why they are there. The fourth amendment would be to determine a sound way of showing a medical or religious exemption, perhaps requiring the unvaccinated person to produce a document certifying that they're exempt. And five, please include a sunset provision in the resolution. Melvin Thompson talked about this and we're in agreement. Please keep in mind that even with these amendments, we remain concerned about the impact of this legislation on our members as compared to what we see as limited positive impact on the community. We look forward to continuing our discussions with the county executive and the council. Thank you so much, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Ms. Corin. Um, the next panelist is Ms. Freeman on behalf of the African American Chamber of Commerce. Ms. Freeman, are you there? We see you are uh, listed, but uh, you are on mute and not on camera. Uh, why don't we go to the next speaker, Ms. Wellens, and hopefully Ms. Freeman will uh, be able to join us in the end. Yes, thank you. Um, the next panelist is Ms. Jeffries uh, of the Strathmore Center. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank you, Council President Albernos and Vice President Glass, members of the County Council. I appreciate being invited today to share our experience. Since September of 2021, Strathmore has required proof of vaccination or a negative PCR test taken within 72 hours with a photo ID to attend events inside its venues. We also require it of our staff, students, and volunteers. It's extremely important to us not to deny admittance to anyone, especially our children, which is why we allow exemptions and negative tests for those not yet vaccine eligible. I do want to note that we're also balancing the requirements of touring artists, collective bargaining units, and organizations who perform at Strathmore and may not have, I'm sorry, or may have more or less restrictive requirements than the venue itself. We do on our website, strathmore.org, have a very extensive list of frequently asked questions um, and answers, and I did want to share some numbers today. Since September, Strathmore has screened nearly 21,000 patrons at a wide variety of concerts and events representing many different cultures and genres. About half a percent of those have been denied admittance for lack of verification. Um, we have found that this can be increased as well when tickets are purchased through third party sites or scalper sites, which has presented some real difficulty because they may or may not pass on the venue vaccination requirements. Since August, 500 plus students attend weekly rehearsals and classes at our education center, and we have not had any incidents of transmission, quite thankfully. We have seen about three to 5% of our patrons use a digital passport, but most of our patrons produce their vaccination card itself or a photo of it. And anecdotally, we can report that most patrons are not yet boosted. 90% of our surveyed patrons report that knowing that others are vaccinated or have a recent negative test does make them more likely to attend although attendance overall is still down by about 40 to 50% for Strathmore in its own presentations, as well as its partners and renters. 
And I would say for the most part, we have found that this process can be smooth with proper training and planning. It's very important to use clear, explicit language in your messaging and repeat that messaging often. We have lots of signage posted exterior to the venue and try to get patrons ready as they are approaching the building so that they can have proper identification and their card ready. It's important to be transparent with our staff about what's required in screening verification. We do offer staff training and practice in checking uh, vaccination cards. We provide samples, show them lots of different types of passports and highlight key dates for them. We also provide extra PPE for our frontline staff. It's important to recognize that for venues um, engaging in this kind of uh, screening that there are additional costs required, signage, PPE, additional staff, security, offering refunds, et cetera. Um, we have found it necessary to offer our staff de-escalation training and solutions planning, and we have found it necessary to have MCPD and security personnel present to assist our civilian staff who are confronted with angry patrons, which does happen. For managing large numbers of repeat or weekly participants, a digital passport can be helpful. We have used Clear to Go with our youth orchestra and chorus students. Parents simply upload vaccine proof, negative test results for underage children and weekly health questionnaires. Some of our larger peer institutions, such as the Kennedy Center, have actually outsourced vaccination checks because they are dealing with such a large number of patrons. We have also found uh, recently uh, lots of challenges during the Omicron surge for patrons who wish to provide the negative test because there are long waits for test results and scarcity of tests, um, so they can't actually obtain them within the allotted time to attend the concert. In thinking about the re resolution that has been proposed, um, we do have several questions of our own, mostly around boosters, which add um, a great deal of complexity to screening um, because they are different depending on the brand of vaccine, the age of the patron, the grace period for getting the booster. Um, and we feel that that would require quite a lot of additional scrutiny from our frontline staff. I'm very happy to share um, additional points of our experience and to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for having me today. Thank you very much, Ms. Jeffries. Um, and the next panelist is Ms. Rohr, representing the Maryland Hotel Lodging Association. Good afternoon. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of our feedback here in this forum today. Um, for hotels, uh, I want to be clear that health and safety of our employees and of our guests is a top priority. It always has been. It always will be. And we have been balancing uh, that health and safety with operational needs in the midst of the pandemic for nearly two years now. Um, with this proposal, I have reached out to other jurisdictions that have uh, vaccine passports in place, and um, what we have heard from them is discouraging, and much of what I'm hearing are the concerns that are being expressed by our members. There, there are three main points um, that I'd just like to quickly go over. Um, th this absolutely would require hiring additional staff that we cannot afford to hire, nor can we find the employees uh, that we would need to hire. So that, that is a big concern and something that we are extremely challenged with uh, at, at this present time. Um, secondly, um, it, it, business moves elsewhere in, in the jurisdictions where this is in place. Uh, we have a board member who operates many hotels in New York City. He can speak personally to that. Um, meeting planners who have the option to hold meetings in jurisdictions where this is not a requirement simply move their meetings when they have the ability to do so. Uh, weddings uh, like just are not going to take place. Um, they may be postponed or they may be moved to a different jurisdiction, but if all of the guests are not welcome at a wedding, uh, that absolutely has an impact on hotels that are often hosting weddings. Um, 
our industry um, has been significantly impacted by the pandemic, perhaps more so than any other industry. And Montgomery County hotels in particular are still suffering um, it, it, more so than many other areas of the state. Um, so the impact on our business, while we still like, prioritize health and safety, the impact on our business is causing great concern. Uh, also, it has been touched on, but require, this would require us putting our employees in a position of enforcement, which is a very difficult position that we uh, would certainly prefer to not put them in. Uh, but if the council chooses to proceed, um, I would like to share some of the feedback that we have ga gathered from other areas. And I appreciate um, Ellen Horan's comment uh, about hotels, and we know that the intent is not for this to apply to every single guest checking into a hotel, but we are concerned that as uh, written, this uh, could in fact apply. The we we would, would be curious about a definition of hotel common rooms and think that that language needs to be uh, cleaned up. I will say that in Puerto Rico, they inadvertently um, uh, have a, they put a, passed a proposal that did just that, and it proved to be disastrous for the hotel industry in Puerto Rico. Um, also, we would ask that you consider limiting the mandate in scope to higher risk settings where masks are not consistently being worn uh, for hotels. Primarily, this would mean when food and beverage is being served. And if you were to consider doing something like that, it would still um, give some meeting planners flexibility. Um, where they may be able to hold an event that is like a trade show type event where masks are being worn the entire time. There is no food and beverage. And so this requirement would not be in place. Um, also, um, the last thing you want to do is create bottlenecks at registration. And um, we have seen language in Chicago that would enable meeting planners to use technology uh, to verify vaccine status in advance of anybody showing up at a hotel. Um, and we would encourage you to take a look at that language so that as much as possible can be done in advance. Hotels do not receive contact information and names of uh, guests who are perhaps attending a meeting at a hotel. And so um, the language that we have seen in Chicago, it helps to streamline that process, but certainly is not something that works for every event. Um, also, um, hotels need more lead time uh, it, in order to put this in place. There is a lot that needs to happen at a hotel as far as um, needing to train staff, needing to hire staff, adjusting schedules, uh, legal counsel would want to review this and advise hotels, uh, the communication to guests, uh, you know, to future guests, to current guests, and to the meeting planners, that there is a lot of communication that we would want to have happen in advance of um, our guests showing up at the hotel. Um, signage, it's not just at the front door of the hotel. Um, the, we may need uh, placards in, um, in the lobby area. Uh, depending on what this looks like. But uh, um, signage in a hotel often has to be approved by brands, and that requires time. We would ask for 30 days minimum um, as far as implementation. Um, there is more on our list, but I'm going to stop there. Um, you know, the, there re truly is a lot required by hotels who have had to implement this, but we appreciate you hearing our concerns. Uh, I want to allow more time for questions, and I'm happy to provide more details if it is helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Rohr. And circling back to see if Ms. Freeman is um, able to join. Ms. Freeman? Hello. Um, barely, unfortunately. <laughs> Ms. Freeman, I'm so sorry. I don't know if it's just me, but I think we're having a lot of trouble with the audio. Um, 
I'm so sorry, Ms. Freeman. I, I don't know what's going on with the technology, but um, uh, please stay on. And if you can uh, move on to a different device or a different location uh, with a stronger connection or that isn't experiencing those problems, uh, please, please stay on and, and, and certainly submit your written testimony and we will follow up with you uh, with any additional questions, but we want to we want to get to the Q and A on the panel. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, that was a very robust and helpful conversation, which is exactly what we were hoping for. Uh, we wanted to proceed with a slightly different approach with regards to this particular public health resolution because it does rise to a different level than previous orders that we have been focused on. And uh, with reams of information from other jurisdictions, it also helps us uh, with, with this particular conversation. I have two colleagues that have requested to speak um, before do, turning it over to them. I did have a couple of questions. Um, the first is for Mr. Thompson, you mentioned that there were mixed views from your membership um, with regards to this. And we know there are certain restaurants, a number of them, who are already requiring uh, proof of vaccination for entry. Um, two part question. The first is, uh, is there a difference between fast casual and uh, longer sit down restaurants in, in, in terms of the division you're seeing? Not division, that's not the right word, but the, the difference you're seeing of opinion uh, and how this is enacted. And just um, from a uh, just policy standpoint, logistical standpoint, do you see uh, a distinction between fast casual and uh, sit down restaurants? Uh, bars, as an example, because New York does provide that distinction in their provision. Uh, DC did not require it in theirs, but they've, of course, just recently implemented theirs, so it remains to be seen how that will work. Um, but I've always been struck by, uh, you know, the high volume places with smaller personnel, uh, you know, that that exist in a fast casual or fast food restaurants probably presents even more unique challenges in terms of um, implementation of this. If you could just provide comment on, on any of that, I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir, and thank you for the question. I certainly do appreciate it um, because of the time limits. I was really rushed trying to get through everything during my initial presentation, so I appreciate the opportunity to elaborate, but you're absolutely right. Um, for full-service restaurants, um, there are some that were already doing this voluntarily, and they have the staff and the setup um, to comply a little easier than a fast casual or a quick service restaurant. As you know, in those types of operations, customers are generally ordering at the counter. And part of the business model is to provide very quick service. And so if you are forced to check documentation, that really slows the service for those types of businesses. And we did hear a lot more concern from that segment of our industry about complying with such a requirement, especially during busy meal times like lunchtime or dinner time when they're really trying to move people through. This really does slow down the transaction, and there is concern that that would discourage customers from dining in um, if this reg regulation would to take were to take effect. Thank you. That's really helpful. And Ms. Rohr. Um... You mentioned our hotel industry, which we know has absolutely taken it on the chin in every way conceivable, and the numbers remain uh, significantly down. I will note that in that short window, and I wish it had been longer, but that short window uh, post-summer, sort of through the fall, when there were many more events re-emerging, uh, every single one I attended uh, at the North Bethesda Marriott Conference Center and a couple of others at a couple of other hotels, the private organizations were requiring proof of vaccination for attendance, but it was those organizations that were providing the volunteers themselves uh, to be able to check folks at the door. Can you talk a little bit about, that seems like a, a, a balanced approach, uh, encouraging uh, private organizations uh, to, if they can and have the capacity through volunteers to be able to check um, but how has or has have you found that synergy to be helpful at all? Um, should that be a model that we, we we reinforce rather than across the board? And how have the hotels been able to provide or can they? I know it's a, a, I'm asking you a broad question here. Uh, support of those events that you know may not be and would like to be able to require proof of vaccination, but 
uh, may be reluctant to do so unless they had some level of support. Just if you can talk a little bit about that dynamic, that would be helpful. Um, there are so many different types of events that occur at, at hotels, and it is really important to understand the role of the meeting planner versus the hotel. Um, you know, there are meeting planners that may have a registration process um, where they can at least be informing their attendees of a requirement for vac vaccination in advance of, of the meeting. Um, there, there is technology out there that I think um, some of the you know larger meeting planners may be starting to implement. I've heard about an app where um, you know you can verify vaccinations uh, status in advance of a meeting. But then there are other meetings where it, you know it may be open to the public, uh, where you know it's promoted and, and um, there is not registration in advance. But again, it's very important that it be the the meeting planner or the third party that is promoting an event that is communicating to potential patrons or guests of, of whatever requirement may be in place and the hotel um it, you know is is in no way involved in the promotion of a particular event that that is taking place at their venue um so i'm not sure if that answers your question but no it, it's helpful i guess um you know i'm trying to as all of us always are, uh, find a sweet spot here because uh, the the premise or, you know, just everyone, well, most people, notwithstanding some of the testimony we heard, um, most people, especially in Montgomery County, uh, recognize the importance of vaccinations. That That's not really uh, is what what's at dispute. Uh, it's whether this is an effective tool, uh, number one, is it work? And then also, uh, are we putting businesses in the best possible position to succeed to actually be able to implement it? Or are we potentially creating some unintended problems, um, at least as many as we're trying to solve? So if not more. So that that's sort of the, the general discussion. And one of those sweet spots, I think, is, you know, working collaboratively between industry and those private events, acknowledging it's not a one size fits all. They are very different. Um, but if there's a way that we can provide support for um, specific organizations uh, who want to be able to provide proof of vaccination as those events that I've attended required, um, I think that might be helpful uh, in, in helping us find that sweet spot. So that, that was more or less the point that I was trying to make, and I appreciate your response. So I have a few more questions, but I don't want to dominate here, and we're going to try to wrap up by 1245, uh, if at all possible. So with that, um, I've got two council members who have requested to speak so far. I'm sure there will be more. Um, but first up is Councilmember Jawando, followed by Councilmember Friedson. Oh, and Councilmember Rice, you'll uh, go right after that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, um, and appreciate everyone joining today. Just for, for clarity, we do have our health staff on the executive side that have proposed this, because I think it'd be nice to merge the conversation there. We certainly do. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. I should have noted that uh, when we got to the Q&A. We do have our public health team here. Great. So, yeah, if they could join, um, I'll start with the the uh, the business side of it. Did, did anyone um, survey their members? I know you all have different membership about who is already implementing uh, a vaccine requirement and who is not. Uh, and, and could you share just briefly, I don't need a long explanation, just what were the percentage, you know, what were the, what were the numbers? I see Ms. Redeker nodding. Do you, what, what was the? One of our theaters is, one is not. Okay. And we didn't hear from any restaurants who are um, fast casual or sit down. Uh, the, the Fillmore is the only other organization that applies that is actually doing this. Um, we didn't hear the, the couple of gyms are not um, only the Fillmore and AFI at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and if I can add, there are large organizations who have capacity um, more similar to what um, my colleague from the Strathmore was, was discussing, whereas most of our members are much smaller and they don't have the capacity to do those kinds of things. Right, appreciate it, thank you. Uh, Ms. Corn. Yeah, um, we did not um, poll our members specifically with that question. Uh, we sent out something to all of our members 
asking them to get back to us with their comments on it. And I don't recall that any of them talked about the fact that they were doing it already. I'm just checking with our, our president of the chamber to see if he has any more information there. And I'll share that with you if he has anything different to say. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Same thing here. We okay. didn't ask that question specifically. We know for a fact some of our members who run small businesses in the community, they're not implementing any of these measures, but uh, we'll ask formally and we can get back to the council with an answer. I appreciate that. Thank you. Council um, member Juwando, I would say okay. for the arts, it's become pretty much a requirement across the industry, largely because most touring artists are requiring it of venues now. So it is rather widespread for us. Thank you. Ms. Roy. I um, can say that the hotel industry as a whole has uh, taken a position of strongly encouraging vaccination by uh, both employees and guests. But uh, I am not aware of any hotels that, uh, you know, have, require vaccination. And Ms. Redeker, did you have one other, something you want to say quickly? Yeah, if, if I could add, um, the Fillmore does, it does also offer a negative COVID test. So it's not just proof of vaccination. It's a negative COVID test that, they, that you can provide. Got it. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah, I think that if, if you, I think that'd be helpful for us to know as we move forward in the discussion, you know, just if, so if you could, particularly between now and next week, ask your members, it's not going to be an exact science. I was going to ask the same question of our public health staff, if, and maybe Ms. Stoddard, is there any, do you all, have you all compiled a list? Are you aware of establishments that would be covered by this regulation of how many are already implementing this versus not? Uh, we don't have an exhaustive list. We know anecdotally there are a number of establishments that are doing it. Um, some are members of chambers and some are not. But I don't think we have an exhaustive list of how many and couldn't break down by percentages. It, I mean, it. it is a small percentage of businesses that are currently doing it for sure. Yeah, got it. Um, okay, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, and to council president's point, I mean, I think if you just step back from this for a second, if you're an individual and you're going to a place where there's, it's a congregate setting where there's going to be a, a medium to large amount of people. Uh, I think the stat that uh, Ms. Jeffries brought up is probably right, particularly here in Montgomery County, that 90% of people would want to know that the folks that are they're going into that congregate setting are in are vaccinated. You know, and you know, again, knowing that there are breakthrough cases, um, and that's not a a foolproof at this point, and not, and also not vaccinated, masked, if not eating. Or uh, and as we already have a mask mandate in effect, uh, and that's that's the policy here and other partners in the region. So I think there's no, you know we need to the majority of residents understand what we're what the discussion's about here. We want to make sure people are as safe as possible. And you know uh, there's a, that's one. There's then there's the secondary health goal of getting relatively uh, smaller than other jurisdictions. I'm still proud that we're the highest vaccinated large county in the nation. Right, that's a, a big selling point, thanks to our residents. But we still do have a unvaccinated population because we're a large county. We still have a thousands of tens of thousands of residents, hundreds of thousands of residents, because of I have I, you know we, if, whether you're a child and you can't get vaccinated, or you've made the decision not to get vaccinated. Um, and we know that our hospitals are telling us. I was speaking to one this weekend that that is putting a strain uh, on our system because unvaccinated folks have more because of comorbidities and a whole bunch of other things have more uh, and more severe symptoms. And so uh, I think, and I just saw the news Sunday, uh, President Macron in France actually said his goal with their vaccine mandate, which had or their vaccine passport, which just passed their legislature, I think yesterday or the day before, is to quote, not my words, his, to piss off the unvaccinated so that they get vaccinated. Um, and so I think that is another big uh, push here. Even our, our numbers are smaller. That's a good thing. Uh, they still have a population that is unvaccinated and is choosing to be unvaccinated. Uh, not, not like my three-year-old son who can't be vaccinated, but he will be as soon as that is allowed. And there's a lot of parents out there that I think will take advantage of that as well. So I guess my, my, my question to the public health team, could you just restate did I correctly characterize the goals of what we're trying to accomplish here in those two large buckets? And if so, 
if I did I miss anything or could you just restate the goals of why we're, why this was put forward by the county executive at this point? Yeah, so there's a few things. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Dr. Slatter. I'll, 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 I wasn't sure whether you were on, Dr. Bridges, or not. I didn't, no, I won't. didn't see it. Okay. Yeah. I, I just have two things I want to say on this. There, we're, I've heard a lot of discussion about absolutes. This won't prevent transmission. That is correct. This will not prevent transmission. Masks do not prevent transmission. Um, they're, they're, when we talk about these are all risk mitigation or risk reduction tools. You layer those reduction tools on one on top of the other and you further reduce risk. And so, yes, people with who are vaccinated and boosted can contract and therefore can transmit COVID. However, the current data suggests that still with Omicron, there is a dramatic reduction in your ability to contract COVID if you are vaccinated and boosted relative to unvaccinated, unboosted. And so this is a risk reduction tool. The data, you know, uh, CDC did it in November, there was five-fold more likely not to be infected if you were vaccinated. That number, that what the, know what that number is for Omicron, but the data being tracked in other places across the country suggests that it's still three and a half fold less likely to be infected if you're not, if you're, if you're vaccinated relative to unvaccinated. So there is still a significant reduction in the ability to contract and therefore in a pool of vaccinated individuals, comparing that to an unvaccinated pool, they will transmit less likely, much, much less in a vaccinated pool because they're less likely to contract. And so just for understanding, you, you're, the, the point of this measure was to reduce transmission, not eliminate, reduce, encourage those who are unvaccinated, including those people who have already only gotten one dose. There's about a 10% gap between our one dose and our fully vaccinated number that we need to reduce. And number two, so that was the point of this measure. Now, I know the council, as soon as the Board of Health has discussed the booster, there are, there are operational impacts on that, but our booster percentage is substantially lower than our two-dose vaccination coverage. So it's important to recognize that as we discuss this, there's a lot, we've done great work in Montgomery County to get people vaccinated. We're not where we need to be as a county in vaccination numbers for sure. Dr. Bridger, sorry. Sure, just to add, um, um, as Dr. Stoddard indicated, and uh, Council Member uh, Jawanda, you alluded to, there's about 14.5% of the uh, county that still needs to be vaccinated. We've been looking at data uh, for the past two years on better practices or best practices. We know that there uh, may be other variants that are on the horizon. Uh, Omicron is a fast moving one. And so we are not only looking at where we are in a response posture, but also where do we go in a recovery posture? And what are those things we need to continuously do to look at having best practices in our community to keep our uh, citizens safe? And so this would be one uh, measure based on uh, various comments today and um, also recommendations, but just looking at that to see where we land to be in a better space so that folks are comfortable in a in a in an eating or restaurant environment or those other places that are proposed. I appreciate that, and I'm going to do what I used to try to do on the basketball court. Probably not enough. I'm going to pass to teammates here on the uh, on the require on the support to businesses because what you heard loud and clear here was cost training workability. So say we agree on the first thing we just discussed of why it's necessary and could be helpful. Uh, I'd love to hear, and I'm sure other colleagues will delve into this, but I just want to say I would love to hear more as the conversation goes on. You don't have to respond right now on what the county is going to do to help offset some of those things, particularly for some of our smaller venues, uh, as you heard today. So, Mr. President, I'll turn it back back to you. Thank you, Councilmember Rondo. Uh, Councilmember Friedson. Uh, thank you. Thanks for uh, this conversation. I'm glad we set it up this way. So thank you, Council President and Council Staff, for, for organizing this. Thank you to all the presenters. Uh, you know, I think it speaks to the challenge of the proposal that's before us. We're talking about Strathmore and Fillmore and some of the largest venues in the county that predominantly are impacted for large ticketed events and have ticket takers and have uh, you know, systems in place that can be adapted, even with costs uh, and uh, training, including de-escalation training and added police, uh, which was uh, noted perhaps uh, required. And then you have fast casual and, and much smaller uh, venues that would be impacted that obviously have a very different uh, business model. And, you know, I think it's challenging to talk about the implementation uh, of this uh, for, for everybody because it is so different. But I just... Think that it's important that we have this uh, broad conversation and, and appreciate 
uh, that I, I did want to hone in a couple of things in terms of the, the outreach. Uh, we've heard from a couple folks today uh, some disappointment that they hadn't heard about this and hadn't been uh, consulted uh, prior to uh, the introduction and, and, and uh, of this Board of Health regulation. The council had been uh, told both uh, anecdotally and in writing that uh, there was extensive uh, outreach proactively specifically to the chamber, some of whom uh, are represented here uh, today. So uh, one, I just, you know, perhaps uh, the panelists could just answer. Uh, there was a, apparently an August uh, town hall specifically to discuss this. If you could just answer yes or no, whether you were uh, invited, whether or not you uh, participated, uh, and uh, whether or not you were involved in a series of meetings and discussions uh, prior to uh, the uh, introduction of this proposal. If we could just quickly go around. Ms. Corn, you could start, with, then Ms. Redeker, Ms. Rohr. I'm not aware of the town hall, um, but we were not consulted um, at all prior to the bill being introduced. Okay. Ms. Okay. Redeker? We were not aware of the town hall. We were not invited. And like I said, it was less than two weeks ago that I I just heard about it. Ms. Rohr? We were not consulted. The first I heard about this was through the media. Okay. Um, Mr. Vasquez? No, we were not aware of the town hall meeting. Okay, Mr. Thompson. I was not aware of the town hall meeting. However, we have had communications with the administration. There was a conference call we had back in September. We submitted some questions to Dr. Stoddard. We've had some phone calls, and I think our communication has been good in trying to answer some of our questions, um, but there remain a few concerns just about the logistics and those kinds of things where the language and the regulation still isn't quite clear. Got it. So just to be clear on that, you were not included in the town hall, but have been in discussions prior to the introduction? Since September, we've been having discussions about this proposal with the administration. Yes, sir. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Excuse Stoddard, me. The, the, call, the call that Ms. Pumps is referring to was the town hall, just so we're, just so we're clear. There were a number of businesses on the Oh, uh, okay. So that it's, was... It was the, it's the nomenclature that matters, but it was, a, it was a telephone town hall. It wasn't a person. And that was in September, right, Dr. Stoddard? Not yeah. August. Okay. I apologize. I'll give my look at the exact date, but it was... Yes. It was September. It was September at high frame. That's correct. Okay. Our materials in writing said August, so that's why I said August. So perhaps that was just a mistake. But if you could provide us, uh, if the executive branch, Dr. Stoddard, could provide us was specifically who was invited to that town hall, who participated uh, in the town hall, what specifically was the outreach uh, to businesses. It, it seems clear that there's a disconnect here between, you know, this broad level of outreach uh, that uh, has been insinuated and what the specific outreach was. Clearly there was some outreach, but uh, the extent to which uh, still remains uh, very unclear. So if you could provide that to us. That would I listened to the invitees to that, to that call. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, speaking of uh, uh, Strathmore, I really appreciate uh, the specifics of uh, some of those uh, changes, some of which, uh, most of which I was probably aware of. Um, and obviously, as I noted, I mean, this is quite different than some other business models. You already have a system set up where there is a ticket taker, there is a ticketed uh, event, uh, you, know, they're, 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 you know, it's a little bit easier uh, to, to, to do. Uh, but, um, Ms. Jeffries, you, you noted uh, the increase in costs and personnel and training. Uh, could you just speak to that, how long uh, that undertaking uh, took both to plan and to execute what the approximate costs uh, might be uh, or have been for, for your organization on the additional uh, personnel, including specifically any uh, new people that you had to bring in, uh, the, the, the police officers? Is that at your expense? Is that a county expense? If you could just go into a little bit more detail on that, that would be helpful. Thanks. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I would say that we prepared, oh gosh, a couple of months um, to make sure that we were ready to host large scale events in the concert hall, which we began doing in August of this year. So late spring, early summer, we were having conversations about what that might require for us. Um, in terms of cost, we haven't brought on anybody specifically to our front of house team other than MCPD officers. We have found it necessary to back up some of our um, 
paid staff as well as volunteers at that checkpoint. Um, and it's not so much even that they have to say anything, although on occasion they do step in and de-escalate situations. It's more just a presence to know that we're serious about the requirement and that people must comply. Um, that is a cost that Strathmore bears itself. Um, and I would say it ranges from two to three hundred dollars per um, event to have that additional police personnel present. For signage and changes to the website development, probably a few thousand dollars um, to make sure that all of that was built in with um, extensive explanation and uh, repeat messaging through email, which we have found to be extremely important. Um, and as I mentioned, when those tickets are sold by some outlet other than Strathmore, we do take the risk that there are uh, they're not passing on those requirements and therefore we end up with a slightly larger percentage of our audiences showing up unaware. Got it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. I, I do think the, the idea uh, at a large scale that there would need to be trained personnel with de-escalation training, perhaps even police officers at individual uh, small businesses does you know, beg the question of you know, how well this could be Im implemented and what the potential impacts uh, would be, particularly uh, on certain businesses and certain communities. But I, I appreciate that. Just uh, uh, going to the public health team quickly, uh, in response to some of the council's questions uh, in terms of citing the uh, uh, increase in uh, vaccination rates, the Lancet study uh, from the Lancet Journal uh, was uh, Included For those who didn't take the time to read the Lancet study, uh, basically it followed six countries that implemented this between April and August slash September, depending on the uh, situation of, of this past year. Um, and it did show uh, an increase uh, approximately 20 days in advance in anticipation for, uh, for it uh, and, and, and to a, a certain extent uh, for about 40 days after. Um, and it mostly focused on large scale events, at least from my read of it, uh, and uh, large scale events and younger, uh, younger people, uh, you know, in terms of the, the most significant uh, uh, impact. Uh, in, in, in that uh, study, if you read it carefully, it also has a glaring caveat that uh, the findings must be taken in the context of what the existing vaccination rates are in the jurisdiction, the hesitancy, and I can bring up the quote if anybody would uh, would, would want, but it, it uh, significantly calls into uh, a question uh, the applicability uh, broadly of it. Uh, so just wondering from the public health team, if you could uh, you know, describe if you had looked at the difference between uh, the six countries, I think it was uh, Italy, Switzerland, Israel, France, Denmark, and Belgium, if I recall correctly, and what those vaccination rates were when the study was conducted between April and September, and what our vaccination rates are in Montgomery County, and how that would uh, be impacted, and then uh, how uh, those differences were used in the uh, introduction of the proposal. So I, I can go ahead, Dr. Rich. I was, I was uh, giving you a second. I, second. I don't have the cross-sectional study in front of me regarding the, you know, the correlation between our vaccination rates, which are high, and those six studies. It's been about, you know, three or four months since I've read them. So if Dr. Stoddard has any immediate data in front of him, I can provide a analysis uh, after this to your office based on what we found uh, as a result of any um, cross-sectional analysis. Yeah, I would, I would say two things. Number one, I, I will, I'll acknowledge that they were substantially lower than our vaccination rates. And it likely, uh, given just the time frame, April to September, there were just lower vaccination rates worldwide, including Montgomery County at the time of the study. And so obviously it's, you know, um, you're likely to see a smaller benefit in Montgomery County, but that you, you would likely see some number of people who this encourages to, to do it, whether that's in the, you know, hundreds of thousands, I can't say. Off, you know, there's no comparable for Montgomery County given our vaccination rates, either in the United States or worldwide for exactly what you would expect to see in this case. I, I do expect you would see some number of people who would come on board, particularly in the five to 11 year old population, which we've seen very, we've seen relative to Montgomery County, we've seen better uptake than many other places around the state, 
but poor uptake overall. And um, despite all of the, the, the vast majority of public health, I say vast majority, the reputable public health experts are all pointing to vaccinations for five to 11 year olds as being safe and effective. And so um, that's just the reality. So we're, you know, that's why we chose to include the five to 11 year olds is because that is an area where we need to see increased um, uptake of the vaccine and where Montgomery County is lagging where we need to be. And so obviously that is that was a choice that was made to try and encourage vaccinations in that population specifically because of that similar uptake. Now the rates in our five to 11 year olds are substantially lower than other countries would have been at this time frame through April to September. And so that tells that suggests that particularly in that population, you might see an increased uptake of, of the vaccine relative to what we have currently in Montgomery County. Appreciate that. You know, the question specifically that was posed because I, I, I drafted it uh, as part of, you know, that was one of my particular questions was similar jurisdictions. So we're a municipal government. It's clear that there are no comparables of similar jurisdictions where we have any real studies or peer reviewed evidence to determine the efficacy uh, of this. Obviously countries and, and, and counties are, uh, are quite different, but I appreciate the, the distinction. To the point of five to 11 year olds, um, you know, part of the, the goal here is to be similar to regional jurisdictions, but then we want five to 11 year olds because that's the real challenge that we have in terms of numbers, that and boosters, right? Which we want to increase, which, you know, I agree with. I want to increase those numbers too. There's a question of whether this is the right tool, but wouldn't it beg the question if five to 11 is the real goal here, as you just stated, you know, working with the school system to require vaccines in schools or working with the state to require them statewide uh, in, in schools ideally would be the better approach uh, to this rather than picking a relatively small number of businesses and, you know, saying that five to 11 year olds can't enter unless they prove that they've been vaccinated. Well, I think including, you know, first off, we're not going to see a vaccine mandate for, for across the state until there's a change in the governor's office. That's pretty clear um, at that point that there that may become an option. But until that happens, obviously, uh, MCPS has been reticent to they, they don't require vaccines distinct from the state. So they've been reticent under the State Board of Education to do that. So until there's a change at the state level, there, that's just not going to happen. So we have to use the levers that are available to us uh, locally to try and address these. We make recommendations to the Board of Health around how we think we can control COVID-19. And that's this is what we're doing in this case. And so obviously, you know, the Board of Health could say, you know, we're not interested in getting into this game. We're going to leave it to the state and the state will do nothing for the next six months. And then that will be the reality. Um, so, I mean, yes, there are more effective ways for, for this to get done. There are not realistic, more effective ways for this to get done. There's no advocacy that we're going to put towards Governor Hogan or his team that's going to change their mind about vaccination requirements across the state because their constituents, uh, at, you know, for the governor are largely um, not as pro-vaccination as Montgomery County is. But MCBS would have the power to do it if they chose. I don't know that they have the power to do it, candidly. I think maybe I, 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 this, so that's a legal question. I don't know if Ms. Kinch or the attorneys from MCPS could address that. I don't know that the local Board of Education can enforce the vaccine mandate. Yeah, it, it would be, we've heard, like so many other things, you know, we've heard conflicting things from the state versus from uh, the, the school system's lawyers of what they can and can't do, which, you know, I think is, we're in uncharted territories here, obviously, but it would be helpful to get uh, an answer to that uh, question as we're, you know, determining what are the best ways to achieve goals that I think we all share in, in some form or fashion, including the businesses that have taken, you know, unprecedented action to try to keep their employees and their uh, patrons safe. I have a lot of other questions. I'll just close on a couple here quickly and then follow up with the rest as we head into next week. Uh, the study was clear as was provided. The only evidence that you, you know, was used here uh, that it goes 40 days after. So the, the question on that would be, what if any end date would the executive branch seem uh, to, to accept as reasonable if this were to be uh, imposed? What if any uh, transition period uh, now that we're past even what is, was proposed in the transition uh, period and the study that you use suggested that actually waiting, uh, the greatest benefit is in anticipation of the requirement, not once the requirement has actually been put in place. That's when you saw the movement in the six countries. I don't think it's totally analogous based on the time, the vaccination rates and the type of, uh, of government. But what were you seeing? And then lastly, um, based on the fact that the goal is to mitigate transmission and increase vaccination rates, what are those numbers? 
if 85% isn't enough of a number for vaccination rates, what is the number that the executive branch would determine to be success? And, you know, what is the level of transmission mitigation, uh, you know, that, that would be, uh, you know, seen as success for this vaccine passport uh, to be implemented? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and just listening to you, Council Member Friesen, uh, great, great series of questions. As we've done before, you know, I, I you know, we look at, at at either a quarterly assessment or a six month assessment just to see whether or not it had a uh, has a greater impact in the community as a preventative measure. Uh, clearly, a, a lower uh, transmission rates, lower case rates, lower hospitalization rates are uh, primary indicators that we need to uh, examine. And when we see those cases, we know that in six months, we will be moving into the summer months and whether or not, you know, it is an effective practice at, the, at this particular time. I think those are some of the things that we will consider and run an analysis with our epidemiologist team. Unfortunately, Dr. Palmore, one of our six medical doctors who are on our primary health, uh, our primary uh, public health advisory committee was on uh, this call, but she had to leave uh, at 1130 to complete her rounds. Um, I, I'd ask her to provide some some uh, additional studies that were conclusive or inconclusive regarding infectious disease management um, from an a infectious disease doc and epidemiologist. So we will have conversations with our public health advisory team to pinpoint those uh, particular periods that you speak on. Appreciate that. I, like I said, I have a lot of follow-up questions. I will reserve those for uh, the interim and for, for next week. But if we could get before next week specifics on implementation period, on uh, end sunset date, which we clearly heard both of those issues raised by uh, panelists and what the executive branch and public health team would see as acceptable uh, on those. And then specifically, what are the metrics uh, that we are going to base ourselves on? What is the vaccination number that we're trying to get to? What are the transmission rates that we're trying to get to? And how do we hold ourselves accountable to see how well we're doing? Appreciate it. I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, so it's uh, 1244 colleagues. Let's try to wrap up by one o'clock just to give us a half an hour break before we come back from the recess. Because uh, we have a busy afternoon schedule as well. So I've got council members Rice, Navarro and Vice President Glass. Uh, council member Rice. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and be quick. So. Um... Uh, since Councilmember Friedson started quoting studies, I decided to pull up a couple of mine as well, including the UCLA study, and I, I attributed this to why it is that we're doing this. Um, because I want folks to understand that for those who are encouraging people to continue to get vaccinated, something that I talked a lot about during our previous meeting, it is because the vaccinated shed the virus at less levels than unvaccinated. UCLA's study was very clear of uh, workers who uh, were vaccinated and who shed and had viral loads that were significantly less than their coworkers uh, who were unvaccinated. And so that's the reason why. So let's just be very clear about that, that it's not just some sort of convenience or some sort of mindset, uh, but those who feel as though they have natural immunities or all those kinds of things, that's all fine and good. But the reality is the science is the science. And it says that vaccinated individuals spread the virus less at less levels than those that are unvaccinated, period. So that's why people also want to be around people who are vaccinated, because it reduces the risk. It reduces the mitigation. Now, all that being said, that's just the reason why we're trying to encourage people to get vaccinated. The question is whether or not this makes sense. And so it's very interesting that Ms. Rohrer brought up uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, that many of you know I used to work for, uh, the government of Puerto Rico, and you also used to work for the Puerto Rico Convention Bureau. So I still have lots of good friends down there uh, and know about what it is that they're doing uh, with their hotel industry as well as their bars and restaurants. Puerto Rico actually has uh, the highest rate of vaccinations out of all the U.S. states and territories. Little known fact. Just thought I'd share that with you guys because they instituted this and it actually uh, seems to be working. Now, again, um, a lot of it is because people who want to visit have to then uh, be vaccinated or have that um, negative test. You can also do a negative test uh, there in Puerto Rico. But it is something where, again, 
Um, you see a country that is based on, and, and dependent upon tourism. I know. I used to work for them. Uh, and it's a huge part of their industry, um, but uh, is one in which they really firmly believe in. And it's interesting that they went even farther to say that for them, it's beyond um, political ideology. For them, it's something that just makes sense in that they can market uh, their region as a place that is safe for individuals to go to. And so I just put that out there because, again, I've heard all the other arguments and I certainly understand the efficacy, all the challenges that are associated, but there is a market for saying we're a safe place to be and you should feel comfortable coming into our bars and restaurants and theater and arts and entertainment venues because we've taken extra steps. Just not 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 pitching for uh, the passport, just saying that that's one of the things that folks have seen. Uh, and so my my question is for Ms. Jeffries, because I really want to applaud. And I think that, you know, she said a lot when it came to our arts and entertainment venues pretty much across this country. I mean, my daughter went to the uh, Jingle Ball. Uh, and one of the reasons why we let her go to the iHeartRadio Jingle Ball is because they had vaccine passport requirement and requirement of masks. And so it was very, uh, they were very vigilant about what it was that they needed to do. Um, so what are you seeing in terms of your numbers, in terms of reductions, increases are staying the same since you've instituted the passport that have affected your bottom line? Thank you, Councilmember Rice. I'm not sure I have the exact data that you're asking for. Um, because we didn't measure prior to the implementation of our uh, requirement, although we did survey and ask people to self-report their vaccination status. And for our surveyed patrons, um, a sample equaling probably around 1,000 people, it was 99% report being self uh, self-reported being vaccinated. So I think we start with a rather high level of vaccination already. Um, but as I shared in our repeated surveys, and we have gone back to our patrons uh, a few times since implementing that requirement, um, they do say that having the requirement makes them feel more confident in coming to concerts. Um, and we have had a very wide variety of kinds of concerts, genres, um, however, our sales are probably anywhere from 40 to 50 percent um, soft, and that is by far what's reported across the industry. I don't think that is uh, limited to just Montgomery County. People are still hesitant to be in large crowds. We understand that. Um, we've made a lot of other um, uh, improvements and mitigation efforts to try to make the air safer, providing a lot more uh, additional space in our rehearsals for students. Um, and as I mentioned, the digital passport for students is working uh, very well. And we've seen that because they, they come repeatedly. They're here every week, whereas our concert audiences, uh, by and large, are just presenting their their cards, not using digital passports. But overall, I think people are feeling comfortable with their experience here. Um, and to our knowledge, we are not uh, seeing any uh, reports of transmission in, in large amounts. Well, thank you very much for that. And Mr. President, I'm gonna turn back to you in the interest of time. I have a ton of other questions, but I just want, just want to close with a comment. Uh, being the chair of the Education and Culture Committee, and it was brought up by Councilmember Fritz. And so let me just, uh, try and close that door a little bit if I can. Um, look, uh, denying a child access to uh, a movie theater or to a fast food restaurant is very different from denying them access to a school building to be able to access their education. So um, we are not talking about apples and apples here uh, in terms of comparisons of what we think we're gonna do to restrict uh, people from accessing in-person education, understanding all the challenges that we've had over this past uh, two years and keeping our kids in school. So we're trying to do everything we can to do that. I do understand that it seems to be counterintuitive to in one instance say one and in one instance the other. 
but we do know that um, the, the tremendous impacts uh, that not being in the classroom has had on our kids is tantamount. And so we need to lead with that effort. Uh, I do understand that it's great for families to be able to get out, to enjoy, to do all the social things that are important as well as families, the things that you know my family uh, loves to do here in this county. But again, um, I do not equate them the same and certainly one in which I hold education to a very high standard in terms of if we are saying that we are going to not allow kids to enter into our classrooms because they are not vaccinated, is very different than allowing a child or not allowing a child to enter into uh, McDonald's or Rogers. So, thank you. Back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. We've got Councilmember Navarro followed by Vice President Glass. We'll have the final word. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you so much. Uh, now the time is uh, getting close here. Uh, two quick things. Uh, number one, um, did the administration, did the executive, uh, have any particular proposals to assist? Um, in terms of technical assistance or funding, assist the businesses that are going to be impacted when um, when he uh, proposed this particular regulation. That's number one. Um, and then number two, uh, in, given that we have such a high vaccination rate in our county, were there alternative measures discussed um, to achieve the goal um, that you know that did not rise up to the level of an actual vaccine passport. And by the way, thank you to all the stakeholders who are here. I know you guys are doing extraordinary work, so I appreciate you being here. Um, but just these two quick questions for the administration. Yeah, so we've discussed a few things on the technical assistance side. Um, most, mostly notably, you know, we were thinking about, what we, we've already begun preparing graphics. I mean, not knowing if, if the council things were help was going to pass or not, but we want to make sure we had in case they did graphics and, and, and like window claims and, and the signage and all those things we've got to help provide, as well as we've gotten working on, you know, the base of guidance to help businesses understanding that we, that we would go towards a training development. But obviously the, the specifics of what goes into the, the, the program as the Board of Health enacts or doesn't would obviously heavily influence that training. Now, as far as assistance in terms of finance, we've discussed that. I, you know, we have not knowing again how far this would expand to which businesses the, the Board of Health would ultimately apply it to. Obviously, it's been difficult to pre-plan on something where we don't have great definition all the way of who would it apply to and who wouldn't. Obviously, if you remove fast casual, for example, that changes the dynamic of, of a of a support program, but it's something we have discussed. And I think we would be prepared to entertain. Just we need to, you know, understand exactly, you know, have some conversations with with the council studies board of health to figure out exactly what the scope of that would be. But I think there is a willingness to support on that on that side. But we just need to have a little bit more fine detail before we can say what that would look like. Um, and second part of your question, I'm sorry. I, Second part was given the fact that we do have a, we're in a oh, county that has a high, very high vaccination rate, were there alternative measures that you discussed that did not necessarily, you know, had to consider something like a vaccine passport? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I mean, we've been looking at, you know, basically we've allowed a level of transmission that, you know, earlier in the pandemic, I think we all, we, we all have all been uncomfortable with seeing these case totals in the, in the 2000, 3000, 4000 level. Uh, but I think for good reason, we've all been resistant to, approach some of the more draconian measures that we had to enact before the vaccine focused around business limitations, gathering limitations, closure, suspension of different programs. And so while we had, we did not want to go down that road. And so what, so really you see the test distribution program that we have really enacted because I think we think that's having an effect already, but obviously, you know, we are trying to look at a more holistic, less deleterious mechanism. And that's really where the vaccine uh, passport or, or requirement program came in as, as, as a way to, you know, not limit any sort of business transaction or interaction, offset that with increased testing and vaccination efforts. But really, this was this was viewed as a um, less deleterious. And it's also why, you know, we didn't include restaurant employees. We weren't looking, we were trying to minimize the harm that we were, we were trying to restaurant employees, all employees of the vaccine passport program. We were trying to minimize the 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 harm that we were going to be doing while still trying to have a benefit in terms of vaccination and vaccination and transmission. So um, we did this, we did discuss in very limited fashion were there other things, but this was easily the least least um, uh, harmful for businesses 
while also, you know, the county is putting forward these tests and other things to try and offset through the mechanisms that we have the transmission rate. And I do think we're seeing the transmission rate start to start to peak out and start to come down a bit. So I think that things that we are doing are starting to have an impact. But obviously, you know, even the totals that we're seeing over the last few days are still far higher than we've seen at just about any period in the pandemic. The peak was just so high that even coming down is, is still a very high level of transmission. Thank you. And I think at the close, uh, if possible, it would be great to have some kind of racial equity and social justice analysis. I know it's not a requirement for Board of Health regulations, but I think even having something from the administration to that effect would be also useful as we deliberate on this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Council Vice President Glass, you'll get the final word. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It might be the final word right now, but clearly this conversation is going to continue. Um, and I appreciate everybody who's participated in the conversation today about keeping our residents and community healthy and safe. And that includes keeping our residents and our businesses um, healthy um, and afloat. And through this pandemic, I've been looking at guidance from the CDC. Um, I think that for at least me and, and I think what we've been doing here in the county has been a constant. And there's been plenty of disagreement particularly over the last few weeks about CDC guidance, but as relates to this, the CDC is silent. And so it's left up to the localities to figure out how to improve vaccination rates and also, again, keep everybody healthy and safe. And when I've looked at the jurisdictions that have implemented the passports, I see that the District of Columbia, as of today, has a fully vaccinated rate of 70.1%. And Boston, Suffolk County, Massachusetts, has a fully vaccinated rate of 73.6%. New York City has a fully vaccinated rate of 73.9%. And because it happened over the weekend and it was invoked in this conversation, the country of France has a 75.3% vaccination rate. One of the reasons I love living here and representing the residents of Montgomery County is because we're incredibly smart and we believe the science and the data. And because of that, we have a fully vaccinated rate of 90.4%. And so I come to this conversation recognizing we've been doing an incredible job of vaccinating our residents. And as we continue trying to figure out how to keep people healthy and safe, it's gonna get a little trickier. That's this conversation. And um, since the vaccines were introduced, I've been to a number of artistic venues and movie theaters. I've been to Strathmore Roundhouse only theater. So I've seen how they have all operated um, from the ticket takers to, to the docents and others um, that have requested vaccination status. And I've also been to a number of restaurants that have required vaccination status, though most don't. So they're outliers, those that do. And personally, I actually thought the restaurants that required vaccination status were using it as not only a health measure, but a smart marketing tool. That if it really does increase business, I would expect more people, and more businesses to do it. Um, one of the aspects, and, and I'll close on this, I see the time. Um, I would like Dr. Stoddard or Dr. Bridges um, to elaborate as to why patrons would need to have a uh, vaccination status, but the employees of those establishments would not. And that's a theme that we've heard um, throughout the course of this conversation. Thank you, Council Vice President Glass. I'm sure Dr. Bridgers may have some chime in. Actually, I was actually just looking at the state contact tracing data and actually the employees of those establishments rank fairly low in the hospitality and restaurant sector in terms of their case rate. You can go to the Maryland contact tracing data, you can look at that graph right now. The employees in those sectors rank very low. But I think from a public health perspective, there's really no, there's no really public health case to say this pool of people don't need to be vaccinated and this pool of people do. It's really, we're trying to respect the requests of the, of the establishments themselves in the saying that we're not supportive of this, this passport or, or program overall, however, you know, as an accommodation, minimally, we would ask that you not include employees as the district has not done to be consistent because they're concerned that employees in Montgomery County who wish not to be vaccinated 
would just go to the district if we required that employees be vaccinated. So because a neighboring jurisdiction who we are modeling after has not included them, that was largely the biggest driver. Now, there is not a public health case to not include them. Just so we're clear, it was much more as an accommodation to the business community to say we're not going to include them so that we don't put your staffing under increased burden. So that is, you know, for an argument from a public health standpoint, there's no public health rationale to not include them. But we're arguing from a, if this is a risk reduction tool, not a risk elimination tool, we see very low rates from Maryland contact tracing data in this population. And we know that it would be really deleterious for them as a business operator. So that was largely the driver for this decision. And just to add things, Dr. Stoddard, I know, as you indicated, the contact tracing data, we know that employee transmission is still in the top five, as well as child care and education providers as well. And so I know that we've had some conversation over the weekend with Ms. Kinch, who's also on the call and looking at the Supreme Court's ruling last week regarding mandates. But as Dr. Stoddard indicated, we were looking at models and best practices to also take into consideration our goal, which is to increase vaccination rate and protect those individuals who are dining, who are unmasked, but also those individual businesses who may be at, have concern regarding their employees and having individuals to come back and support their business establishment. So we've taken a step back and we looked at all those metrics as well to also inform counsel. And I'm sure we will have additional conversations regarding this when we talk again, but we're looking at all those updated metrics as well to have a better conversation and a more robust presentation. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. I have other questions, which I'll save for either the public conversation next week, or I'll reach out to you privately so we can continue this conversation. But I appreciate everybody who shared their voice and opinions today. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Vice President Glass. Thank you to all of our panelists. I'll just note one colleague sent a text as we're wrapping up that most of the questions have been responded to. We greatly appreciate it. There are a couple that we're looking for some expansion of. For example, was there a cost benefit analysis done on this particular order? So I'll just note that we will have another public hearing next Tuesday. We will have another discussion with our colleagues from the executive branch. We will follow up with colleagues to determine how many more questions you all may have that have or have not been answered. And that will dictate whether we are prepared to vote on this next Tuesday or not. We want to be methodical and thoughtful about this process because this is obviously, this order has a lot of consequence to it. So thank you all. Just a housekeeping item for my colleagues. We will commence our public hearings at 145, 145, not 130. And we thank everyone this morning. It was an important discussion and we needed to allot an appropriate amount of time for it. So I'll see my colleagues again at 145. With that, we are adjourned for recess. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Trying to rush through. Can I get a motion to accept the consent calendar? So moved. Second. By Councilmember Rice, seconded by Councilmember Katz. Any discussion on the consent calendar? No discussion. All those in favor of the consent calendar, please raise your hands. And that is- Aye. I'm here. Aye. That is unanimous among all of us. Thank you all so much. So with that, we are adjourned for recess and we'll be back at 145. Thanks. Thank you.